It's 900 hours Central Africa time, Jumbo Africa on this very good Friday. Very good morning to you, Kendall. No, good morning to you, Elvis. I'm Elvis Preston. Now, we'll be with you until 12 o'clock today. We focus today on the life of the late former ANC president, Oliver Reginald Tambo, who would have turned a century or 100 years old today, Kendall. Absolutely, and uh, we want to find out from you this icon, this icon of what South Africa is. What can we learn from the legacy of O.R. Tambo's life? Well, that's the question we pose to you. Let's take a look at what you are telling us on the Twitter handle. Ati Mbena says, education is the key to success. Tambo and Mandela led the first black law firm in the country, representing mainly the oppressed people. This one coming from Michael says, being a true leader and a visionary. Now that's what we can learn from our tumble. True that, Michael. You can keep them coming. We'll read them as we continue, but we're also conducting a poll. Shocking news. German software giant SAP has confirmed that they paid 107 million rand to companies that were linked to the Gupta, uh, company, uh, the, the Gupta family, Kendall. Yeah. Yeah, they report themselves to the United States Department of Justice. Uh, clearly, it's nice to be feared, isn't it? Well, yes. the United States of Justice, uh, Department of Justice is the one that's receiving all of those apologies and reports. We want to find out from you, following this apology by Sap, is it time for the Hawks to investigate their Gupta leaks? Well, there you have it. Hashtag Hawks. Are you supposed to investigate, Mr. Hawk? <laughs> Boto says they are captured. They won't do anything. All they will say is that we are investigating, but Dolo Lo Akshi. Very interesting there that almost 140 of you of the 154 that voted say yes, they need to be investigated by the Hawks. 90% that was. Mahapa Noel says Hawks keep saying they're investigating, but arrest Dolo. I hope they do their jobs this time around. Well, keep them coming. We'll read your comments as we continue, but we're also, it's a, it's a weekend, and it's a sporting question that we normally pose for you, of course, this time around. The Curry Cup final. It's rugby. If you're a rugby fan, mm -hmm. the Sharks will be playing Western Province. Absolutely. It's a coastal derby. Should be, uh, should be fireworks between those two, and we want to find out from you, what are your predictions for the Curry Cup final between the Sharks and Western Province in Durban tomorrow? So let us know what's on your mind. Let's take a look at what you are tweeting us. This one from Martini says, double change... Chance win. 32-24. Huh? Well, to, who, sure. to who? To we'll who? Okay. We'll ask you. Atini, please tell us some more. What do you mean by that? Pilani Washa says, uh, I am going Blue Bulls. Really? Blue Bulls? They're not in the final, Pilani. <laughs> but it's well, okay. Keep them Blue Bulls man. We'll read them as we carry on today. But right now, let's take a look at your news headlines. Today, South Africa marks the centenary celebrations of the late ANC President Oliver Reginald Tumbo. Police say about six prisoners have escaped from the privately operated Kutama Sintumele prison in Louis Trichardt in Limpopo, where there is a work stoppage by the workers. And uh, vote counting started late yesterday in Kenya's controversial presidential rerun, which was marred by violence. Now, those are your headlines. And before we get to the news, let's find out from Kendo Makamate what's happening on the sports front. Morning, Elvis. Uh, before we get into what's happening on the weekend, we also have a result from uh, uh, the T20 between the Proteas and Bangladesh. No yeah. surprises there. <laughs> the Proteas won. Good morning to you. This is what we have for you in the sports today. The Proteas defeat Bangladesh by 20 runs in the first of two T20 matches played at Mangaung Oval in Bloemfontein. And Venus Williams gains revenge for her Wimbledon final defeat by Gabin Muguruza when she advances to the last four of the WTA finals with a gutsy 7 5 6 4 victory over the Spanish world number two. And of course, the Curry Cup final promises fireworks as the Sharks and Western Province join battle in the coastal derby. Kickoff for that match is 4 p.m. tomorrow. Of course, we also have Telcom Cup last 16 are starting tomorrow as well. But more about all of that a little later at 10:40. Stay with Elvis though, as he's got the news. Thank you, Kendall. Top story this hour: Airports company South Africa AXA 
says they have been reliably informed that the highway blockades around Oar Tambo International Airport east of Johannesburg are purposely intended on preventing passengers from reaching the airport on time for their flights. This morning, the R21 and R24 is at a complete standstill after metered and Uber taxi drivers abandoned their vehicles on the highways. Several trucks have also been abandoned after drivers fled in fear of their safety. Now, we'll keep you updated on that story as it unfolds today to let you know what's going on. Now, police say about six prisoners have escaped from the privately operated Kutama Sintumela prison in Louis Trichard in Limpopo, where there is a work stoppage by the workers. The stoppage led uh, to disruption of services and prisoners started to protest. Police say they have deployed public order police and the tactical response team to search for the escaped prisoners. The Kutama private prison accommodates over 3,000 inmates. The names of the escapees will be released this morning. The situation currently is under control. Uh, we've uh, checked all the perimeters outside and uh, at this stage there was escapes. We don't know how many escaped. Uh, we're still busy investigating that. Um, we've, we've seen that uh, the presence also set a light. So we'll, we'll managing uh, cases like uh, MI2P, arson, then also the escapes. So this matter has been prolonging for a very long time. The issue which we are talking about, the pension, the company is refusing to pay employees pension according to the Correctional Service Act. And we were employed ac according to the Correctional Service Act. They are not even complying to their contract. Now, vote counting started late yesterday in Kenya's controversial presidential rerun, which was marred by violence. The Electoral Commission postponed to tomorrow elections in four protest-hit co counties where voting failed to take place. Opposition leader Raila Odinga is boycotting the polls, terming the process a sham. That marked the end of a largely tense day in Kenya, a day when a section of the country went to the polling stations and another section took to the streets to protest. We had uh, earlier said as, as an AU uh, election observer mission, we'd appeal to, uh, uh, to everybody in Kenya really to that those who are, want to vote should vote. Those who want to boycott the, the, the election should go ahead and, and boycott. But that we should all of us avoid any violence and any, and any of that kind of activity. Voting in four counties where there was <laughs> violence will commence on Saturday. It indicates that indeed there have been problems uh, in parts of the country, which is why the IABC has taken that, that decision. In terms of the, 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 the polling stations that we have visited here and, and in Kiambu, uh, people were the uh, stations opened and people participated, the numbers varied. The head of the AU Observer Mission, who has since dashed to South Africa to deliver the OR Tambo lecture, is expected in Nairobi on Saturday morning. Yes, that's why I'm, I'm running away now. I must go to the airport. I must go and deliver a lecture in South Africa. It is not clear yet when the final results will be announced. Sophie Mugwen, SABC News, Nairobi, Kenya. German software giant SAP has admitted paying a bribe of 100 million rand to get contracts from Transnet and ESCOM. A Gupta-controlled company apparently helped SAP to secure the contracts. SAP has instituted disciplinary action against three top managers. It has decided to eliminate sales commissions on all public sector deals globally, including South Africa. The Hawks have not contacted SAP to investigate these allegations. It has disclosed information on its uh, South African business to American authorities responsible for enforcing the U.S. Foreign Corrupt Practices Act. Amabungani, which has released the Gupta leaks regarding this issue, feels vindicated. We feel vindicated. You know, the report that we put out initially, there was quite strong pushback from SAP. Uh, there was a statement which was put out immediately by one of their senior executives saying, you know, that they were considering all types of action. And it sort of sounded like they were threatening that they might take legal action against us. 
That executive was very quickly suspended uh, or placed on administrative leave, as they like to say. And now, after three months, look, they haven't given us a final, uh, the final results of their investigation, but what they are saying is, yes, you were right, there was over 100 million rand paid in commissions uh, to sort of Gupta-controlled and Gupta-owned entities. One of the journalists asked SAP, well, have you, uh, have you been in contact with the South African authorities about these allegations? They told us there's been no contact between SAP and, and the local authorities. Now, is that, we don't know, is that, you know, that SAP hasn't approached the Hawks or the Hawks haven't approached them? I mean, we're talking about allegations that came out three months ago. One would least have hoped that someone from the SA authorities would have gone and started, you know, taking initial statements, that kind of thing. Revelations and, of course, an apology from SAP. And that's why we're asking you this question on our poll today. We want to know from you, following the apology by SAP, is it time for the Hawks to investigate the Gupta leaks? Some of the companies linked to them received a, over 100 million rand. So, thus far, we have 186 votes in. 90% of you on the continent, as well as uh, here in South Africa, are suggesting that the Hawks should investigate. Well, only 10% are saying no, they should not investigate. Let's take a look at what you're telling us. This one from Phil says, it's been time to investigate. It's about time, probably. Atini Mbena says, um, yeah, showcase it's high time to investigate uh, the Gupta leaks. We want to start a new chapter with CR17. South Africa will be great again. Well, there you have it. These are some of your comments. You can keep them coming. Read them as we continue. Meanwhile, a senior police officer charged with investigating the deaths of mentally ill patients says he'll establish a separate unit to focus on pursuing possible criminal charges against individuals implicated in the life many tragedy. Major General Charles Johnson was taken to task on why the police had not investigated the deaths of some 141 patients at several NGOs as soon as the cases were reported at various police stations as far back as September last year. Appearing before the Life is a Domani arbitration hearings in Parktown here in Johannesburg yesterday, Johnson said they were investigating only 127 of the deaths. 38 inquests have been opened while the other 89 are being treated as inquiries for now. We don't have the hospital records. We don't have the re clinical records of the people that was moved from life ECD many. And we do not have most of the information and in records, clinical records, medical records from the NGOs where the deceased were taken to. It's critical that we have both that uh, medical history and the clinical records to determine whether there was any negligence or not. The late former ANC President Oliver Reginald Tumbo would have turned 100 years old today. And Mzana in the Eastern Cape will be a hive of activity ahead of his centenary celebrations today. The festivities will be accompanied by service delivery projects such as housing, roads, water supply and a new computer lab for special needs learners. A festive mood envelopes the area. The realization of projects coincides with what would have been Tambo's 100th birthday. Pupils at Vukuzenzele Special School among the beneficiaries. We are here to hand out the computers to them, creating a cyber lab for them as well, not to feel because they have their children living with disabilities to be left behind. They were honored by receiving these laptops today, which are going to help our learners to access internet. Uh, education now relies too much on technology. The community is now benefiting at grassroots levels. The newly built Ludega Dam, part of the Greater Mbizana Regional Bulk Water Supply Scheme, has officially been handed over to the local authority. Ludega Dam will provide water for the entire Bizana 
local municipality. We have completed phase one, and that phase is already supplying over 52% of the, of the communities. More than 20,000 people are expected to descend on Pizana. President Jacob Zuma will lead the celebrations. Ivoe Poti, SABC News, Mbizana. The centenary celebration, so let's now cross live to our reporter, Unati Bengose, who is in Ludeka village in Bizana in the Eastern Cape. A very good morning to you, Unati. It seems to be very cold out there. Can you tell us what's happening out there? I tell you, Elvis, it is very, very, very cold, but um, the cold weather has done very, very little to dampen and the spirits of the people of uh, the Great Ambizana local municipalities and, of course, um, the Alfred Zod district, they are here in numbers. That I can assure you. Uh, of course, it's all happening down at um, Gandolo uh, village, which is about uh, some... Um, uh, five kilometers away from where I am, uh, but we are coming to you live from Ludeke village. And uh, this is where he is expected, and uh, that is where the president is expected uh, to make his first stop uh, before going down to Gandolo uh, to make the address uh, in the official celebrations, centenary celebrations of Utata Uar Tambo. What you'll be doing here, of course, is very, very symbolic uh, and very, very important. And uh, it's something that was closest uh, to the heart of Utata Uar Tambo. He will be handing over a house to a very, very destitute family. We've already spoken to the old lady who will be benefiting from, from, from this house that is going to be handed over uh, by President Jacob Zuma. 81-year-old Mama uh, Mambanja who says she's been living in a very, very dilapidated house. In fact, we saw it for ourselves. I mean, we can attest to that. Uh, it was in no condition uh, to be occupied by anyone, especially not, not to mention an 81-year-old uh, old lady who was occupying it, of course, uh, with her grandparents six of them uh, and of course uh, he has expressed uh, the sincerest of, of, of gratitude uh, for, for what uh, the government has done of course it is um, government in action uh, doing service delivery and I can tell you that um, the centenary ce celebrations of OR Tambo really really have been a catalyst for fast track uh, service delivery particularly in this area as you've heard in that inset um, earlier on of course um, it was the handover of the Luteke Dam which is set uh, to benefit um, thousands and thousands of community members around here uh, bringing clean uh, water uh, to villages around this area, villages that had initially uh, been um, getting water, fetching water from rivers and dams, sharing it to, with animals. So there is a great improvement uh, that is happening here. Of course, uh, that is why you are seeing uh, possibly those jovial people behind me. They are here to witness uh, this handover of this house. And of course, it's not just one house we're talking about here. Of course, this one is going to be very, very symbolic uh, in that it will be handed over by the president. But it's one of about 1,000 house, houses uh, that have been built, RTP houses that have been built uh, for villagers here because there's been a lot of complaint uh, particularly from those in rural areas that um, a lot of RDP houses are centered in urban areas which is what has been blamed partly for driving people out of rural areas to, to, to urban areas in search of uh, these RDP houses that they so desperately need, even in these rural areas. And the uh, government has taken a very, very bold and very, very brave step to ensure that uh, they are bringing those services to those people, to these people where exactly they stay. So that is what the president is expected to, to do here. And of course, apart from handing over the house, and uh, there will be a ceremonial switch off of the light. This area has just been electrified. And the electricity for a while for, for a number of years now uh, it has been electrified and of course uh, it will also be a symbolic uh, switch on of that uh, electricity and we do expect that uh, the energy minister uh, mr david Mashobo, is also going to be here for that uh, but speaking to the locals here they have expressed uh, the greatest of, of gratitude uh, to government for what it has done uh, for this community and one glaring improvement uh, that i've got to mention uh, is that um there has been a tar road connecting the town of Pizana and the village of Gandolo. It's a road of about uh, 13 kilometers, and it has improved uh, the traveling time quite significantly. Um, um, but, uh, of course, like, like I'm saying, uh, there's a lot of hive, of hive that is happening here. Uh, but uh, with all that is happening here, I'm sure uh, greater things are even happening uh, down at Gandolo. With that, let us cross, cross over to my colleague, Yves Wepote. I understand she's standing by here to give us the latest on what is happening down there. Yves? 
Thank you so much, Bunati. And definitely, uh, down here where we are, everything has already started. A setup is still continuing. As you can definitely see behind me, the stage is being set up. A number of community members have also made their way through. Definitely, you know, when we look at the centenary celebrations, uh, they are marked by service delivery, which was very close to the heart of Utada Oartambo. Speaking to some of the community members earlier on in the year, they said when he did come back from exile around 1990, he first thing he did was to call a community meeting and educate them in terms of their rights, saying to them, education, key, and that they should ask for a school where we are, the land where we are. We're very close to the OR Tambo Technical School. But you know, when we speak about service delivery, we're going to speak to the mayor, um, Uma Muma Fumbata, who's going to tell us a bit more about uh, the service delivery that has been happening throughout the year to the community members. But I think, Mama, first of all, let's start how are community members feeling now that we are in the celebratory mood? Singati <laughs> Engosi ke msasazi na bapula puli ema kaya mandi ito indo kukuba bonke abandu bakutu ukusuke lange mini ya ngomvulo. Ebe kutalisa sisenza imi nyata la elolflobo silungisele la lom nyata la omkulu. Ubu ibona imi yiyi kakungena ingo keli zaabu. Kubangu kubambi sana kwetu e, singu maspala wasema kaya umaspala we district municipality umaspala we pondo no maspala kandlunkulu iyabonakala lo ntu basinga soloko sonke sibambisene ngolhlobo abantu bakuthi inkonzo bangazifumana ngokukuko and ubani kakuxelela msasazi ena baphulaphuli emakhaya kukhona umqela omkhulu emveni koba sisukela mhla kuvotiwe ngomhla ka Triku August kukhona umahluko omkhulu ubunokujonga back okanye ube nazo ne photos eli yaxesha ungabona into ba umqela owenziweyo ngurhulumente okhokhelwe i African National Congress ungapha yakokuba usazi kuba noba singena kweziphi noba zimbizo zosodolopha uyababona abantu bakuthi bonwabile yoke lo ndosi city lo mhla usibonakalisa into kokuba thina singabantu basembizana e Alfredo sazalelwa igala yoke lo ndosi vuya kakhulu I think um, more from the executive mayor of the Alfredo district as a whole, um, including Imbizana, a very wide and vast area where Unati was um, earlier, Eluteke, is where Utata Oar Tambo actually did some of his studies. I know throughout the day the program includes some of the things that he enjoyed, such as sport and horse riding and stick fighting. But let's speak more to the um, executive who will tell us more about um, the state of readiness, how many people are we expecting to see as well as the dignitaries that will come through. Uh, in terms of the preparations, I understand in Bizo have there have been quite a lot and memorial lectures throughout the year. How many people are we expecting to see today coming from this area? Yes, good morning to you and the viewers at home. Uh, we are very ready for this occasion. And I want to say, uh, let me start by saying, Happy birthday to that OR Tambo. Definitely. Uh, we are very, we are in a celebratory mood. We are expecting that because of the hype and the aspiration that the people of Alfredo are carrying. Uh, we are expecting more than 20,000 people that will be here today. And uh, everything is in order. Everyone, if you, an ordinary person that you can meet on the streets, want to come to this occasion, and uh, the hype is very high. Um, let's also speak to the uh, service delivery that has been done in this area. Obviously now community members very jovial because they've been able to access um, government through the name and celebrations of Utato or Artambo. Also, I mean, for someone who actually fought for um, a movement where the ordinary citizen is actually gaining from government and living a better life, 
what kind of backlog did you have previously and how has this um, celebratory project actually benefited the people of Mbizana as a whole? Yes, let me thank the president of the country for a deliberate effort that he has done. Once he, had, he declared this year as the year of OR Tambo. And then because of the backlog and the scars of the apartheid, uh, we went to the president and tell, told him about the service delivery backlog that we have in Alfredo. One of the problems, what, what was major, was the dam, the Lutiaga dam. That dam, we couldn't attic, we, we retitulate to the people. The people couldn't get a clean water because we didn't have the money to regulate the dam. But because of our president and the current government, we managed to regulate to four watts that will deliver, that will be, uh, uh, th those watts uh, today will be receiving th those, uh, that infrastructure. And at the very same time, we are very grateful of the provincial government and the, the, the provincial government and the national government for a deliberate effort to give those services. Many people will get houses today and uh, decent life, and uh, that was fought for, the, that was, uh, what that Oat Tambo fought for. And he visualized this thing of getting the services and the right to the people. And then today we are very grateful that all those services are, to, are, are coming to the people and they are very happy. Uh, they are a very in a joyous, uh, jo joyous mood. Thank you so much for your time there, Executive Mayor. Thank you very uh, much. Makulu. Definitely we'll be bringing you more from here in Gandolo. But I think most important is the fact that everything that the international statesman Utata Owar Tambo stood for is happening at his centenary. But for now, it's back to you in studio. Now, for more on Oar Tombo's legacy, we are joined by Zola Skiwia. He was the former Minister of Social Development as well as an MK veteran. He, he joined the ANC in 1956, went for military training in Tanzania, 1963, where he met Oar Tombo. He worked for the ANC in various offices and capacities and was also responsible for setting up the ANC office in Addis Ababa in Ethiopia between 1982 and 1985. He represented the ANC at the Organization of African Unity before he was recalled to Lusaka to set up the ANC Legal and Constitutional Department there. In all of those positions, he worked very closely with Owar Tambo. A very good morning to you, sir. Good morning, Owar. I want to take you back, and I want you to tell us about your relationship with Owar Tambo. Oh, I know him more. Yes. Yeah. Well, we first met Oliver Tambo, mm -hmm. the president at the time, mm -hmm. in Tanzania. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had just arrived in South Africa. I mean, in, in, Tan in Tanganyika. Yeah. The fact is that uh, we just, in fact, it was the beginning of the first refugee camp for South Africans. Mm. In Tanzania. So there were not many people, mm -hmm. except the nurses that had been there before. And they had been sent by the by also OR mm -hmm. to try and help Tanzania at that time. So we lived there, just outside Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. And we lived there, and uh, we were just young people. So we would just come in and eat and go away, mm -hmm. try to get out of the place as fast as possible, because there was nothing worth doing. Mm. So we came this other day, and then we went and slept. Then all of a sudden, the following morning, we woke up. We found this old man. Not old, but he was uh, <laughs> yes. elder than us. Yeah. Yes. He was a little bit... Then I could see it from the chap who was in charge mm. of the whole situation, uh, Ramotsi. Mm. Uh, he, he was a little bit... Never, so something like that. Mm. So uh, we just look, what is wrong with him? Then the more this, then he talked to this old man, then he comes back and he tells us, then the old man came to us. <laughs> and we started talking to him. Mm. Then we just thought he was one of the refugees for us. Mm. He was just dressed like us normally. Yes. In fact, he had a, a reddish, Skipper with a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. 
uh, logos. Yeah, code mm -hmm. or something like that, which most probably in South Africa, no man of such a position mm -hmm. in there would put on that. <laughs> and all of us were just understand, what is this one now? Yes. Then he was giving. Then after some time, so we went, we went and we went, cook, 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 guys, and ship, mm. and eat and ate breakfast. Mm. And the break type of breakfast we were eating, it was sliced or bread, mm. but very thin. Mm. So it was an order most of us used to look at the sun through that, and then trying to make it. <laughs> then he looked at us and then, and he went, can I see that? Mm. And he shook his head and he mm. went away. Mm. He went the other back to the other people. Yes. And then when we were already on the other side, we'd taken the, the tea that we're eating. Mm. And then he came and asked, is that all you're eating? We said, yes. Mm. And then uh, mm. this uh, Ramutsi became more nervous than any other thing. Yes. So we said, I said no, there's nothing. And then after we had gone the other side, he told us, that is Oliver Tambo. Uh -huh. So we said, what, well, this man, can he be Oliver? All of us started looking at him. And mm -hmm. He didn't look like the man we knew yes. from the pictures or something like that. Because mm. it was just normal, like an ordinary Tanzanian. Mm -hmm. Then later on, as we talked, sat around with him, we, we knew he was speaking the truth. That was Oliver Tambo. Mm -hmm. In fact, one of us, the kind guy that come from the trans guy came over. They mm. phoned in. Mm. We were all shocked and kept mm. quiet. Mm. They said, yeah, yeah, we answered. Mm. We answered. Mm. That he could speak close at that yes. time. We all became very, mm. you know, just like the old man was talking. Yes. So you were uh, shocked at that point? We were shocked. And mm. Uh, mm. From then onwards, we saw that this man really, he quarreled with Jimmy Kader. Mm. Oh, he, Jimmy Hade was the one who was the representative. Mm -hmm. He called, he said, Jimmy must be brought. And he was brought, and he was told, he must bring food now, mm. Mm. by all means. Where he gets the money, that's him. He said, money is not a problem. The problem, we've got people here who are used to three meals a day, and they just eat this type of bread, like that. Do you eat that? Jimmy said, no. Mm. <coughs> then they went, and they came back with a small truck mm. uh, <coughs> with two Indians. Mm. They offloaded everything, a lot of food, mm. even post otis and every other thing, mm -hmm. meat and vegetables and everything. Mm. Then we felt that this is yes. the guy. Yes. Now, that man is the president of our country. As a leader. As a leader of our. Of the African National Congress, yeah. and of course, MK. Yeah. Uh, how would you describe him as a person? As a person. Mm -hmm. He's a very kind person. Mm -hmm. He was down to earth as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And you could discuss anything with him. And he would try to listen to you, what you are saying, and then he'll come back mm -hmm. and tell you, no, that is possible, that is not possible mm -hmm. in general. He was a little bit, he couldn't compare to the leaders that we, we met on the way. Mm -hmm of the ANC and those in Dar es Salaam. Mm -hmm. He listened to all what we did. He called us individually. Then he called us as a group, what are your problems? Mm -hmm. And then some came and said, there is no, there are no cigarettes and what and every other thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, he just laughed and went away, came back. Cigarettes were brought mm -hmm. for these guys that smoke. Mm -hmm. And uh, all the way right through, he was that type of a person who was easy to approach. Mm -hmm. And uh, to say anything to him that concerned you or concerned the organization, mm -hmm. and he was very caring. Yes. And uh, what is there? Orderly. Yes. What we, what is there today? Do you think that uh, the African National Congress and political leaders in general can learn from the life of Oar Tambo? Yeah, they can learn. First of all, they have to be human beings, mm -hmm. and that being a leader does not necessarily make you to be above the other people in general. Mm. You should be able to, to judge the situation, come up with a clear-cut understanding mm. of the person that you are talking to and the, the situation in which he is and which you also are in, mm -hmm. and then be able to do that. 
That is the type Oliver Tambo was. You could, I mean, as more years came, that was 1962. Yeah. Uh, when last we saw him, I saw him, that was uh, just before he, in fact, the time, the time when he got the, the stroke mm -hmm. in general. Okay. Now, we unveiled uh, his uh, life-size uh, uh, monument at the O.R. Tambo yeah. International at the airport then, and there's the celebrations, of course, that we work towards this coming Friday. Do you think that that is enough that we are doing as a nation and as the African National Congress to celebrate his life? Personally, I would say no, it's not enough. Mm -hmm. That man sacrificed so much for this country and for the people, irrespective of whoever you are, mm -hmm. you were, uh, he wanted to make all the people to understand that we're South Africans and that we're all equal in general. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't even ask sometimes, he didn't ask the question if you went, you know, there was a lot of big division that existed among South Africans, those that go with the PAC and those that go with the ANC. Mm -hmm. And of course, those that go with the PAC at the time were better treated than the ANC, mm -hmm. simply because there was a rumor that was going on that we work with the whites, and the uh, PAC just wants Africans mm. in general. And this was believed, in fact, by all the majority of countries mm -hmm. in Africa. It was only after Oliver Tambo worked harder and worked uh, with the government of Tanzania, specifically with Mwali Mo Munyerere, mm. that many countries began to understand what the ANC is all about. And uh, the speeches that he was giving, and the way he was detailing everybody, even within the PAC, when they had problems, most of them used to come to him. Mm. Despite mm. the fact that uh, he was supposed to be the wrong person, most of them would come back to him, and he says, we don't have clothes, and they say, you have no food, and he would try by all means that they get what they mm. are entitled to. As, as a father or some yes. sort. Yeah, leader. Mm. So, if you say it's not enough that we're doing, what else do you think we should be doing for Owar Tambo to celebrate his life? Yeah, we should have taught our youth mm -hmm. in general who Oliver Tambo was and what he stood for. Mm -hmm. So that what he stood for does not end up possibly with my age group, mm -hmm. but also goes on even with my great grandchildren to understand who Oliver Tambo was, what did he do for South Africa. Mm -hmm. he, he led the ANC to be understood and to be recognized by almost the whole of Africa. Yes. And from Africa to the anti-apartheid movement. He was one of the founders of the anti-apartheid movement abroad in Britain, mm -hmm. and uh, also later on in the rest of, mm -hmm. of the world. So I, I think that we should have taught our youth, even in our history books. I don't think possibly I understand we don't teach history. Mm -hmm. And is that true? <laughs> well, not, not, it, well there's, there's, there's a move towards it, but I think it's still there at, at, as we speak. No, it's not, it's not the truth. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think so. Mm, mm. And I think that was the biggest mistake we've made. Because we need history. We, yeah, we know. And we need the life of Oliver Tumbo yeah. to lead us in that yeah, direction. That is the question. Mm -hmm. uh, all of the children should have been able to do history from the beginning, mm. even from standard one mm. up to metric mm. and uh, at least a one course or something like that from post mm. post metric and mm. be able to understand what type of a person Oliver Tamba was mm -hmm. and be able like not like the children we have now mm -hmm. uh, majority of them are petty bourgeois uh, and uh, <laughs> they, they don't want anything that is something that does not mix with with what they do at school mm. in general mm. Mm. so if we are able to do that to teach the teachers what Oliver Tambo lived for. Yes. And why did he sacrifice so much of his life for mm -hmm. the sake of the ANC, for the sake of the people of South Africa? Mm -hmm. One of the things he didn't want to is the fact that the ANC should die when he was in, in fact, when he was in charge of it. Yes. Because uh, it became very clear that after the arrest, the Rivonia trial, there was no other person who mm -hmm. could lead it. And it was only him who was able to do that, talk to all these countries, and we went to all the African countries that could, at that time, mm -hmm. uh, train us. Yes. Mrs. Uh, Kweyia, I thank you so much. And we will be celebrating his life this entire week. Yeah. But thank you for coming in and talk to us about your experience in meeting <coughs> Tambo. 
Thank you. But one thing that I should focus all of us, I think almost is the only leader, I can say so now, is the only leader amongst the leaders of the ANC, especially for those who came from us, because we did not know Mandela, we read of Mandela when we, he was already underground. Mm -hmm. So we had no personal understanding mm -hmm. with Manes Mandela or even, it was more the question of uh, following yes. the line. Yes. But Tambo was there in front of us. We knew that he was doing everything for South Africa and was trying to make sure that all of us in all parts of Africa mm -hmm. and to get the necessary education in general. I thank you so much, sir. Thank you, thank you. That was Zolo Skuiya. He is the former Minister of Social Development and the MK Veterans Movement, of course, here in studio with us. Back live, sentencing is underway in the so-called coffin assault case in the High Court sitting in Middleburg this morning. Theo Jackson and Willem Oosthuizen concluded their submissions on Monday asking the court to be lenient. Let's find out what transpires there and we go live to court. The accused used the K-word during the assault of the complainants. <laughs> Accused one said he referred to the second complainant as a suspect because the second complainant ran away after he called him. On the other hand, the second complainant testified that he ran away because he did not trust the accused because of the way the farmers mistreat black people. The accused stated that the second complainant was not the first person to be put inside the coffin. They had on previous occasions put black people inside the same coffin after suspecting them of crime. They did this in order to scare the suspects. And none of these incidents were ever reported to the police. This gives credence why the complainant ran away when he was asked to stop. The conduct of the accused towards the complainant and the undisclosed black persons who went through the same ordeal goes against the spirit of the Constitution. The preamble to the Constitution provides, amongst others, for an intention to heal the divisions of the past and establish a society based on democratic values, social justice, and fundamental human rights. These are the rights I've already alluded to. The complainants were badly assaulted, kidnapped, intimidated not to report the matter to the police. And without diminishing the seriousness of the accused general conduct, the most appalling act by the accused was to put a living person in a coffin against his will under threats of killing him. They put the coffin inside the sealed dish and forced the second complainant inside the coffin. Whilst inside the coffin, they threatened to set it alight with petrol. 
They ask him how he wanted to die, quickly or slowly. The conduct of the accused was most dehumanizing and disgusting. These actions appear very clearly from the ev video evidence tendered by the accused. The pain and trauma that the second complainant experienced can only be imagined. He still lives with the consequences of the ordeal he was subjected to despite receiving counseling. He testified that he's afraid of going out and meeting people in public. The video evidence was tendered mainly to refute the second complainant's version of the assault. The video evidence did not serve the purpose it was intended, but corroborated the second complainant's version of inhuman treatment. Throughout their evidence, the accused maintained that they did, they did nothing wrong and indicated that they did not regret their actions. The only time that the court heard of any form of remorse on the part of the accused was during the evidence on sentence. <coughs> they both indicated their regret in putting the complainant in the coffin and not taking him to the police. <coughs> As already indicated, accused number two further indicated that he regrets his actions because of the impact the case had on his family as well as the looming sentence. The accused gave evidence at the trial over a year since the assault and still indicated that they had no regrets. During the evidence of the complainant recounting the degrading treatment at the hands of the accused, accused number one threw his hands in the air, signaling <coughs> lack of difference. The accused only indicated some form of regret to the probation officer after their conviction. Contrary to their evidence during trial, the accused told the probation officer that, and I'm, co I'm quoting from the probation officer's report, open <coughs> quote, during the time they were incarcerated and awaiting their trial date, they had time for introspection and reflection to consider their actions towards their complainant. And they then realized that they did wrong to the complainant and they are remorseful about what happened and their part in the incident, close quote. <laughs> The statement is clearly at variance with the evidence before court. <laughs> the evidence of the accused and their conduct during the trial 
clearly display a lack of remorse. The court appreciates that in relation to the two counts of assault with intent to cause grievous bodily harm, there was no proof of the extent of the injuries sustained by the complainants. And the court accepted that this was largely because the complainants were afraid to report the incidents to the relevant authorities. Further, the medical practitioner who examined the complainant some months after the incident did not corroborate the evidence of the complainant in respect of the injuries allegedly sustained by the second complainant. However, the evidence before court indicates that the seriousness of the offenses far outweighs the mitigating factors and the personal factors of the offenders. The conduct of the accused fuel social division and racial tensions. In our society, there are increasing acts of racial intolerance and racially motivated crimes. Accused number one is only is tw is only 29 years old, and accused two is 30 years old. The accused are relatively young persons who spend most of their lives in a democratic South Africa during the period when serious efforts are being made to create an advanced society that is envisaged in a constitution. The conduct of the accused confirms that a law still needs to be done by the state, the public, and the court as well to ensure that those who dis disrespect our Bill of Rights and the Constitution as a whole are brought to book. Does the court have a duty to safeguard the rights of all citizens as enshrined in the Bill of Rights? The community must be able to sense that the courts are seriously striving to maintain peaceful and safe living conditions. For the reason stated, I'm going to impose the following sentences. May the accused rise. In respect of accused number one, I hereby sentence you as follows. In respect of count two, that in respect of assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm to Mr. Delta and Setole, the first complainant, is three years imprisonment. It's accused number one. number one. Thank you. In respect of count three, relating to the assault with intent to do grievous bodily harm to Mr. Victor Tabile Monojo, the first complainant is three years imprisonment. Count four in respect of kidnapping is five years imprisonment. Count five attempted murder is seven years imprisonment. 
Can six intimidation in six years imprisonment? The sentence imposed in respect of count three is ordered to run concurrently with the one imposed in respect of count six. The sentence imposed in respect of count four is ordered to run concurrently with the one imposed in respect of count five. In respect of accused number two, I hereby sentence you as follows. In respect of, in respect of count two, relating to the assault with intent to cause, to cause grievous bodily harm to Mr. Delta and Sitole, the first complainant, three years imprisonment. Count three, assault with intent to cause grievous bodily harm to Mr. Victor, Retabilum Lojo, the first complainant, three years imprisonment. In, count four, in respect of kidnapping, five years imprisonment. Count five, attempted murder, seven years imprisonment. Count six, intimidation, six years imprisonment. Count seven, defeating or obstructing the administration of justice, three years imprisonment. The sentence imposed in respect of count three is ordered to run concurrently with the one imposed in respect of count six. The sentence imposed in respect of count four is ordered to run concurrently with the one imposed in respect of count five. Accused number one, you are hereby sentenced to 16 years imprisonment, five, of, five years of which is suspended for a period of eight years on condition that you are not found guilty of any offenses, of the offenses you convicted of during the period of suspension. You are effectively sentenced to 11 years direct imprisonment. Accused number two, you are hereby sentenced to 19 years imprisonment, five years of which is suspended for a period of eight years on condition that you are not found guilty of any offenses you convicted of during the period of suspension. You are effectively sentenced to 14 years direct imprisonment. Accordingly, your bail is hereby revoked. Can you can we just take a break and how long will you need for it? I'll be in my chambers and you'll advise me as soon as I'm ready. The court will adjourn. All right. Well, there you have it. Breaking news, of course, there. The judgment in the case of the of the Coffin case, the High Court in Middleburg this morning, Theo Jackson and Willem Oosthuizen, uh, of course, uh, receive 11 and 14 years respectively between the two of them. Now, we'll give you an update on that story and some reaction coming from the sentence. Will it pose as a deterrent to those who want to embark on racial hatred and intimidation and kidnapping, especially in those smaller towns? That's another question we're going to pose to you sometime next week. Well, what do you make of this? You can also let us know on the Twitter handle at SABC Newsroom as well as on the Facebook page. You heard it there, the coffin assault uh, case there. The accused, both of them, accused one, 
uh, of course, uh, three years in prison, three years for um, kidnap five years, five years for kidnapping, uh, seven years uh, as well as intimidation, six years altogether. That's for accused one assault, uh, GBH, uh, three years. That's for accused two, uh, three years for um, kidnapping, five years for kidnapping rather, and. Uh, there's intimidation as well as defeating the ends of justice three years altogether 27 years for accused two and from that you receive 14 years the total amount for accused one received uh, was 16 years five years were suspended and effectively 11 years in prison now we want to find out if we can get hold of our reporter in court to give us the latest from there and some reaction of course receive uh, from the gallery there as soon as we can get hold of uh, our reporter in there uh, we'll bring you that live as well while we wait to see if we can get our reporter and we see if we can get hold of him uh, we will then uh, give you an update as to some of the responses uh, from the uh, from the court there in Middleburg. But it seems like we cannot get hold of our reporter immediately. We'll bring it a little bit later. So let's just take a look quickly now as a reminder, because it is 10 hundred hours. Let's remind you of our top stories. Today, South Africa marks the centenary celebrations of the late ANC President Oliver Tambo. Police say about six prisoners have escaped from the privately operated Kutama Sintumela prison in Louis Trichard in Limpopo, where there is a work stoppage by the workers. And further afield in Kenya, vote counting started late yesterday in Kenya's controversial presidential rerun which was marred by violence. Now, as soon as we have our reporter up and running in Middleburg, we'll go to him live to give us an update there. But meanwhile, as you know, we're celebrating the life. We're celebrating the life of O.R. Tambo. Now, the late former ANC president, Oliver Reginald Tambo, would have turned 100 years old today. And uh, it's all happening in Mbizana in the Eastern Cape it was a hive of activity ahead of uh, the centenary celebrations uh, that is happening there now as you know the festivities will be accompanied by service delivery projects such as housing water sub water supply roads as well as a new computer lab for special needs learners A festive mood envelopes the area. The realization of projects coincides with what would have been Tambo's 100th birthday. Pupils at Vukuzenzele Special School among the beneficiaries. We are here to hand out the computers to them, creating a cyber lab for them as well, not to feel because they have their children living with disabilities to be left behind. They were honored by receiving these laptops today, which are going to help our learners to access internet. Uh, education now relies too much on technology. The community is now benefiting at grassroots levels. The newly built Ludega Dam, part of the Greater Mbizana Regional Bulk Water Supply Scheme, has officially been handed over to the local authority. Ludega Dam will provide water for the entire Bizana local municipality. We have completed phase one, and that phase is already supplying over 52% of the, of the communities. More than 20,000 people are expected to descend on Bizana. President Jacob Zuma will lead the celebrations. Ivoe Bodi, SABC News, Mbizana. Now today, South Africa marks the centenary celebrations of the late ANC President Oliver Tambo. Let's go live to Bizana, where our reporter Ivewe Potti is standing by.
Well, and again, welcome. Well, what I can tell you is that very close to Tata Oar Tambo's heart was education and making sure that people empower themselves. I mean, when I read the books, mainly the reason why he went on to study law was to ensure that his people and him as well understood the law and what their constitutional rights were. Also, the constitutional right that we have very close to his heart, some have said, you know, he was the key role player in forming that constitution. But I think most important in this day and age is technology moving forward and as well as communication. We're going to speak to Minister Mamlogo Kupai Ngubano, who's going to tell us a bit more in terms of the importance of technology enhancing an area such as Mbizana and Gandolo yesterday handing over some computers at a school of a disadvantaged learners. But the importance, Minister, I'm going to ask you to tell us a bit more um, about technology advancement and especially the youth looking at this year's celebrations, the life and legacy of Tata Oartam. Technology is very important, especially for rural areas. We are saying let's not leave the children who are coming from rural areas behind while we are urbanizing, while we are moving with technology. The importance of us moving into a rural community and ensuring that they have a cyber lab, it's part of that. But not only a community that is in rural areas, a community or a school that is for children living with disabilities so that they also can feel that they have not been forgotten but they are included. So part of what we are doing, as much as we recognize that this is a technology, Tata or Artambo emphasize the importance of education that's why when you look at his life you'd find that this is a person who valued education more that's why part of our message today to the youth is to say go back to school focus on educating yourself equipping yourself with the necessary skills so that tomorrow you have a better future Tata Oartambo always felt that the youth were the key to a better future and a successful future for South Africa. What are some of the lessons or messages that you think that the youth of Ngandolo and Bazana as a whole can learn from this great legend? The message we are learning out of the life of Tata Or is that it doesn't matter where you come from, your background, your family. You might be coming from a small rural village, but if you are committed and you are dedicated to becoming a better person, the sky is no limit. You can be that person. So to every young South African, forget about your background, forget about your environment. Be determined to becoming a better South African and making us proud as leaders, as communities, because with today's opportunities, it is possible. Thank you so much for your time, Minister. And uh, definitely, I think what we can take from Utata Oar Tambo and education as well is the fact that, you know, in his time he was oppressed and he had to repeat grade six two times, although he had passed the first time, because he was oppressed and financial situations were of difficulty. So when we see the South African government work towards better education, I guess it's a dream come true, even though he's not yet to see it. But for now, it's back to you guys in studio. Thank you, Viva Party. We'll go back live to Bizan a little bit later. But right now, we'll take a short break and we'll be right back after that. This distinguished CEO would say the best way to enjoy a brandy is whilst wearing diamond encrusted lamb's wool socks. Accompanied by the smell of fresh money. Woo! <laughs> really? Sock diamonds? Well, we'd say a brandy enjoyed with last night's pizza works just as well. Get a Clip Drift brandy plus a two liter Coca Cola for only $124.99 from Tops at Spa. Spa! Do you have a funeral policy? Making someone's dreams come true is not always as simple as saying yes. But Avbob's cashback funeral plan not only provides funeral insurance for your family, but also helps you to say yes to life's little extras. Because for every five claim-free years, you'll get an entire year's premiums based on your monthly premium value paid back in cash. SMS Duduza to 41790 and we'll call you. Avbob, we're here for you. If you want Avbob to contact you, SMS Duduza and your name to 41790. 
Now, yesterday, a senior police officer charged with investigating the deaths of mentally ill patients says that he'll establish a separate unit to focus on pursuing the possible criminal charges against individuals implicated in the Life Isidemeni tragedy. Let's go to the arbitration process live. So end of June 2016, we got a report that all patients have, had been transferred to various uh, facilities and there were no challenges reported to the board. And at that point in time, was it not an opportune time to request for the documents? In each and every meeting, council, we were requesting for all the documents to be submitted to the board because we're also concerned that we didn't have enough documents to, to monitor these transfers, discharges, because by then there were no deaths reported to us. Did you follow up on the list of the NGOs that, were, that was not provided? In each and every meeting, we're requesting that list from Hannah Jacobas, who was overseeing the, the project. Uh, and expression. all that was minuted? All that was minuted. And what would be her response? Still that we're busy, we are editing them, there are still new NGOs, other NGOs <coughs> are no more functional. We, we used to get those stories. And we, I must say, we are also frustrated as board members. Ma'am, I would like to refer you to file number one. Thank you. On page 18. Oh. This is the report. Yes, please. The numbering appears on, on top, the corner, on the right corner. This is the report of the Ombat. I presume you have seen it before. Yes, I've seen it, Council. If you could please open page 18 of the report. And go to paragraph. Can I you see the numbers at the bottom of the report? The numbering 4.1.15. No, page 18, 1, 8, at the right corner of the report, bottom right. Mm -hmm. Top right, just this. I the, think I'm on page 18. Number. Paginated numbers. Yes, please, please. Thank you. 18 paginated or 18 of the Ombuds report? Paginated. Justice. And what paragraph is that? 4.1.15, Justice. Thank you. If I may just confirm, did you have an, an in, did you speak to the Ombud about the, the Gauteng Department of Health Marathon project? Uh, I was invited to go in be interviewed. You were interviewed. I, yes, I was interviewed. Yes, this is a brief uh, interview that's recorded on the report. If we could go step by step, I, I wish you to, to, I will invite you to comment. Yes. The first bullet point says that the board I is said to be independent, but when the Ombud requested for information, it was copied uh, the director mental health as per her instructions. Yes. Uh, this is true. When I received this, I received the message from the secretariat that the ombudsman phoned the department, the unit, I would call the unit, requesting some documents from the secretariat. And as a chairperson, I was supposed to compile those, um, uh, the report that he requested. And after compiling them, I gave them to the secretariat to forward them to the ombudsman. But because the secretariat did not belong to us as board members, they belonged to the directorate. The reporting party was the directorate. So there was this policy that was arranged between the secretariat and the directorate that each and every document that leaves that unit must via Dr. Manamela's office. So what happened at that instance did you agree to that arrangement? 
Yes, yes. Yes, we did. Because our independence, Mr. Justice, was very much infringed as a board. We didn't have our own human resources. We didn't have staff. So we were using Dr. Manamela's staff. We Good. didn't have budget. So everything was supposed to via her because those secretariats were reporting to her. And did you know that your independence is being infringed? We're quite away, and we're fighting for it from the first day when we, in, we were incepted. We wanted to get clarity on our independence. And unfortunately, the person who employed us, the MEC, who was supposed to come and give us more guidance, we never met our, M, our MEC until the 19th of of, of December 2016. You go ahead, Council. Yes, I have a number of I, questions to ask you, but I'll do that much, much later. Okay. Yes, I, I think the question, uh, Mrs. Masondo, is the issue of were you part were, were you part of the instructions to to copy the director of mental health on every correspondent that was going out? Yes, you were aware. Yes. And if you go further down, it, um, bullet point number four from the, the last one, it says that concerns were raised with the director mental health care, uh, uh, MHC services were not addressed. So what concerns are these that you raised? Uh, the concerns that we used to raise with the with a director mental health was the issue of independence the issue of authority, the issue of staff, and the issue of budget. Mental health review board's involvement was minimal. Were you concerned that it was minimal? Yes, I was very concerned. Hence, hence I had to report that to the ombudsman. Because when we wanted to participate fully <coughs> during our <coughs> induction, we were told not to participate, we will, be in, we will be involved at a later stage. So our involvement was very minimal because in many instances we tried, you know, to push our noses in the, in the project, but we were told, we're always reminded about our core functions, which is reviewing of documents. Yes, now in relation to the project, in relation to the Gauteng Marathon Health Project, uh, were you concerned that about the, the minimal involvement of the board? You know, initially, at, um, during our induction period, which was also haphazard, we were not concerned that much because there were no deaths reported and we used to get all the positive reports at meeting level. When did you become concerned? My, our only concern was after uh, getting a report about the first deaths. When was that? That was in July 26, 24, 26. Was that from an, an NGO or from a, a government facility? Uh, I must say that one was uh, Dr. Manamela came to the unit to report the deaths at Kalinen Healthcare Center. And she in, uh, requested members of the review board who are from Swane to go and investigate. And indeed, Three members of the review board went to do those investigations. Who are those members? Uh, it was uh, Mrs. Moloto, Tandi Matebula, and Rodina Matibe. And Were they the, reporting to you? Yes, they reported to me. Yes, what was the report that you got from them? The report was that um, the number that was given to them, they said it was only five deaths at Kalinen Care Center. But was after, given to them by who? That was given to them by who? Who gave them the number of five? Dr. Manamela. Yes. Yes. She mm -hmm. said they must go and investigate about the five deaths at Kalinen Health Care Center. Yes. And then when those members went to do a thorough investigation in the center, they told me, and in writing, that there were 11 patients who died at that center. And because those were experienced uh, mental health uh, nurses, they decided to, not, to initiate a, a, a plan of visiting the nearby NGOs now because they were also concerned. They did the Kalinen Care Center 
and they, they identify some ma major challenges there. And then they said, because we are at Tswane, can we do the remaining nearby NGOs? Remember, they didn't have the addresses of the NGOs, but they had to get information from the facility manager, and they were given five nearby new NGOs, which they decided to go and inspect now voluntarily to monitor the quality of care. The report that they gave to you, what were the conditions from those NGOs? Uh, some of them, like um, uh, I think El Ka I can't remember the name, Al Shaddam, Al Shaddai. They were functioning very well, and others were poorly functioning. The conditions were really appalling, especially at Siabadinga. The skill, the staff was not skilled, was not skilled. Hygiene of the place was not appetizing. There was no medication. And, and, and there was no food in that center. Because and when did they tell you about all this? <coughs> Immediately after the visit, uh, Mr. Yeah. Justice. What, what month would that have been? That was July 2016. What's and then that? from there, they further visited. Uh, well, let's not oh, move away from oh, that that quickly. Okay. Okay. Um, they also said, told you that the administration was poor. Yes. They told you the diet was poor. The records. They told you about winter and the patients not properly clothed. Mm -hmm. um, they told you about the poor quality of care and that the managers there were not skilled. Is that right? Yes. What did you do with that? We compiled a report and we after compiling the report, it was submitted to Dr. Manamela and to the MEC. And I had a meeting with Dr. Manamela to check why is, this, is it like this? Because according to my understanding, there was a team who was supposed to edit these NGOs before placement. Where is the report you compiled? All the reports, Mr. Justice, are with mm. the MEC. Even for these visits and the H.O.D. or M.E.C.? M.E.C. M.E.C. and Dr. Manamela. But currently, because... You're we talking about the past M.E.C.? And the no, past. no, the current one, because when this new M.E.C. started, she also uh, uh, requested all the reports, and we compiled the reports and we submitted the file to her. You know, at the beginning of your evidence, you said you were employed in the department. Was that your view of your role? Can you please repeat your question? <coughs> At the beginning of your evidence, you said you were employed by the Gauteng Department of Health. As a chairperson of the review board. You saw yourself as employed? A part-time employee. Yes, by whom? By the Department of Health. But your job is created by statute, isn't it? I think part of that, Mr. Justice, was supposed to be explained to us, but because of that poor orientation. No, but I saw you read from the statute. Yes. Which you clearly have in your possession. Yes. And your job was to oversee, even Dr. Manamel. You I'm were to oversee how establishments treat and deal with mental health care users, isn't it? I'm not sure of that because we were told we were working under Dr. Manamela. No, we what as that, both what does the law say? What does it tell you? Hey, I must say, Justice, I'm not sure of that when it comes to overseeing Dr. Manamela. But why do you them? draw a salary of 25000 plus over nearly eight months? seven months, and you don't do the job that you paid for. I think, uh, according to, to my assessment, Justice, we did almost everything according to the Act. No, but 60 hours of your employment, you're supposed to review transfers of patients and their conditions at establishments. Isn't it so? Yes, when they are submitted to us, after they are being transferred. 
They are transferred in the institutions. And that did not happen in relation to SCT Mani. And you continue to draw your salary, and you did nothing about it. That one, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not sure of that. You're not sure about what? Yes, I'm not sure about that. But why didn't you put your foot down? You know, you have amazing qualifications. I admire your qualifications. Thank you. You are a professional nurse who has achieved a lot in mental health care. Yes. Why didn't you raise your head? Why didn't you say, I'm the review board? It's my work to make sure that patients' lives are protected. Why did you do that? I think, uh, Mr. Justice, after placement, after hearing about the deaths, I really threw my weight. I was fighting day and night. As a result, some Why did you do it even before? Even before, Mr. Justice, because of time frame. We, we, we started in January, and the termination was end of March. And when I gave you the detailed presentation, did you say, is this going to work? Can you move so many human beings to unknown NGOs? You were never given a list. I don't did, think you, did you say, as chairperson of the board, this is unacceptable? I, I must say, Justice, even if we're querying that, but we're under the impression and we trusted our colleagues that they did a thorough research and survey of the NGOs. Your job is not to trust. Your job is to review. Yes, and you're paid for that so that you can be the eyes and the ears of vulnerable patients. Yes, yes Mr. Justice, I agree. Isn't it so? I agree. You are paid for that? Yes. Council. Thank you, Justice. So basically, you are saying that in July, you, you, the board receives a report that uh, five people have died. Is yes. that correct? Yes. And then you investigated further and you discovered that that report was incorrect because yes. 11 people had died. Yes. Yes. And then you undertook a project of trying to investigate other NGOs to check the conditions. Yes. So at this point in time, obviously, um, this is the point where you really needed to be more concerned, yes. especially about the minimum involvement of the board. And you had raised the concerns at this point in time with the MEC and with Dr. Manamela, and um, you did not receive any joy. Yes, no joy. Now, after this, did you escalate the matter to their superiors? Come again. Did you escalate the matter? You know, from that meeting, after hearing about the deaths, I, firstly, I discussed the issue with the MEC, that we are really concerned And there is MEC Kletani Matlami. Kletani Matlami. And you had a one-to-one -one meeting with her? Yes. To uh, say, as... When sorry. was this meeting and where? It was a, a meeting in her office where I actually advised the team that I feel as board was member... Was she alone or were there other people? She was with other people. It was a, a sort of a, a short meeting. There was a secretary, a PA, where I expressed my concerns that we are really worried about the number of deaths that were reported to us, and we as board members were told not to participate. And from now onward, I even said to Teboho, who was a PA for, for the MEC, Teboho, these are my conduct details. From now onwards, when the team from this MEC's office is going out to review any of these NGOs, I must be part of it. Irrespective what did the MEC say? You're talking to a PA now. What, what did your she the MEC the, say? Yeah, I said to her that I want to be part of this. And she said to me, Mama Sondo, please give your particulars to my PA so that Tebuho must always involve you whenever there are any movements regarding these visits to NGOs. So indeed, I left all my particulars. But did you tell her my independence is being eroded? I told I am you. prevented from doing my statutory duties. I have no documents given to me to review. And I've been kept out of life as a demand. Did you tell her that? Yes. She was going to come here. We want to ask her that. Yes. So you told her that in your meeting? Yes. Okay. And then, 
Yes, this was in July now. Mm -hmm. And then did you now become involved as a board? Did you, did you get to do <coughs> responsibilities in respect of the patients that were transferred from life as a domain? Yes, after July, with the, with the board members, we made a meeting and we reached consensus that from now onwards, we must be visible in all these centers, irrespective of the 80 hours. Because remember, mentally ill patients, mentally ill patients was our passionate patients. We served these patients for quite a long time, and we've never had quite a number of them. <coughs> so we're so concerned, and we did this voluntarily. Mm. Out of 80 hours, we would do 100 and something hours. And How when we you... claim, nobody was listening to our claims. How did you become involved at that stage? Right. After that death, uh, we had a meeting again with the MEC because I was pushing my availability in all the meetings. That was on the 24th and 26th of August, where we sat down with the MEC and the team trying to strategize the system, to improve the system now. Issues that were discussed at that meeting was that we need to have more additional skilled staff in all these NGOs. We need to have a dietitian who will be overseeing all the NGOs to make, make sure that the diet is of the high standard. We need to make sure that uh, medication is available. And again, what was of importance again was that we need to make sure that each and every NGO has got a diagnostic set, meaning that it, it, they must have a paminometer, a stethoscope, to check these patients on daily or weekly basis. And we need to have a drug control register and the other systems that were put up on that particular day was to say, there are quite a lot of teams in the district, skilled teams from our team. I'm talking about trained mental health team now. And the system was that, let's form an MDT team in each and every district. And then out of this MDT team, every week, they need to go to the nearby NGO to inspect these patients. What is an MDT team? It's a, it's, sorry, it's a multidisciplinary team. Multidisciplinary team. Yes. Those so, resolutions, were they implemented? Yes, they were implemented. In all the NGOs? In all the NGOs. From when? Um, uh, from, because the meeting was on the 24th and 26th of August. And then thereafter, there were teams they put uh, in, in, in place. And then after How many people had died then, in uh, August? In August, the report that we used to get, Mr. Justice, was that it was 37. The report that we get from Dr. Manamela. And but why didn't you know? Your people were, you were saying, going to every NGO to go and look. Why didn't you know how many people died? Our, our staff was not going there, Mr. Justice, on a daily basis. We were banking okay, on... Let, let, let's test the proposition. Mm. <coughs> the Ombud says you went to Siabadinga. Yes. And, and records that in the report. Did you, did you go anywhere else? Yes. Where else? We went to Siabadinga. We went to Shama. Tell us about Shama. Shama was functioning well with few challenges. Where was it? It was in Pretoria, in El Shaddai. And how El many people were at Shama? Shama, they had, though I don't have the exact figure now, but the numbers were manageable. And the other one was El Shaddai. How many people died at Shama? None, according to my understanding. None, none died? Yeah. We'll, because come, back, we, we'll come back to that. Yes. yes. And then El Shaddai again. Where uh, was El Shaddai? Also in Tswane. Where in Tswane? Oh, I'm not sure about And Shama too, house. where in Swami? Also in Pretoria. In fact, all these NGOs, Mr. Justice, all the new NGOs were at Twani. But where in, in Swani? You know, I wouldn't know the exact township. You don't know? The exact township in Swani. El Shaddai, which township was it? It's also in Twani. Where? No, I'm sorry, Mr. Justice. I'm not well clear about, but all I know, they were around uh, Twani district. And Did we you read the reports that your colleagues compiled about these places? Yes. Can I give you more places? We, I went to Precious Angel as well. Yes. 
And what was happening there? And we Did went, you go there physically? Yes, I was there physically. Yes, yes. where, where and is it? It's in Atridville. I think that one is Atridville. Where in Atridville? Oh, gosh. I wouldn't know the, the exact township, but I know it was a house in Atridville. Did they have one place or more there than were two. one? There were two places. Where was the second place? Not very far from the first one. How many people died as precious angel? During our visit on the 5th of September, the report we got was that eight people died at a, at a, on that particular day. Do you know what the total tally is at precious angels? Total death of patients. Mm. I'm, I'm told there were 18. How much? 18, one eight. We'll come back to that. I'm sure council will put that to you. It's almost double that number. So. And what did you find at Precious Angel? Um, Mr. Justice, at Precious Angel, it was myself, MEC, and the team. Did the MEC go to Precious Angel? Yes, I was with her with on you. that particular day, yes. yes. With Dr. Manamela and part of my team. Yes. Uh, when we arrived there, it was on a Monday in the afternoon, around about 2 p.m., Patients were in bed, covered with heavy blankets. Uh, it was during the day, according to our policy, mental health policy, patients are not supposed to sleep during the day. That was number one. There were no stimulation programs. There were no activities. And then I proceeded on to check on the cupboards to check if there was food. There was no food in the cupboards. There was no food. There was no food in the cupboards. And then um, I checked on the stove. There was a small pot with cabbage, small cabbage. And the surrounding environmental factors were really, they, they were old metrics. The ablution? The ablution well, well, the facilities. block. Ablution block was dirty. And something that I was interested at, as somebody who has been inspecting these centers, the washing rack, the toothbrushes to prevent cross-infection. They were not labeled according to the patient's name. And patients were just dull and sleeping, you know. There was nothing And how many me. patients were there when you were there? Uh, um, there were 18. And from that center, I interviewed one caregiver because, you know, she appeared very depressed to me. And then I tried to find out what is the problem. And she started to be tearful. And she said to me, Mrs. Masondo, I've got a problem. For three months, I've been working here without a salary. And I've got a child who is attending crash. And I've got a rent to pay at the end of the month. And the situation was really not favorable. And the MEC that Dani Machango had and saw all this. Yes, was I was with you. I was with her. And then when I tried to find out from Ellen, who was a manager, she confirmed the statement that for three months they didn't receive a salary from the department. Were there any professional nurses on site? There were no professional nurses. Any social justice. worker? No social worker. They said they are having a, an outsourced social worker an outsourced professional nurse. Any occupational visited. therapist? No, okay, there was no team. And many, many people on wheelchairs, isn't it? Yes. Not at, at that home, in that other, because there are two homes there. And you and the MEC see all this, and what do you do when you get back to your offices? We got back to the offices, we complained about it, especially to Dr. Manamela, because I was under the impression yeah, but that... But the MC is in charge. To whom is she complaining? No, the, the, the reason I discussed this with the, um, Dr. Manamela, because I was told there was a team of DDs who were overseeing the NGOs, especially the payments here, because I was worried about having patients in those centers without food, without payment. And the MEC addressed the issue, and she said she's going to attend to it that very day. She's going to make sure that that center is being paid. And then after that precious angel, we went to... Do you know why the center had not been paid up to that point? They said they were still working on paperwork when I checked with Dr. Manamela. Apparently, they were somehow blaming the center that they did not submit 
the required pain. Why did you insist that the patients who are there, who are in obvious mortal danger, are moved immediately? There's no food, there's no ablution, there's no cleanliness, there's no professional care, no proper medication. Why did you say, take these people away, they're going to die? That was the plan, Mr. Justice, because finally we did that. Because we couldn't just move them without making proper arrangement. If we move those patients, we need to arrange with other NGO or the hospital vescopies to take over the patients. But finally, the move was that. Fine, patient, patients were removed to vescopies hospital. What did you do with the immediate needs that were obvious, like food, for example? At Precious Angels. Food? Yes. Did you? Uh, Ellen, uh, that lady, the CEO, said to us that very morning, she had somebody, one of the company, who donated food. You mean for the that owner of Precious Angels? Yes. Ethel? Yeah, Ethel, sorry. Ethel. So, so she said she was expecting food? Yes. Did you follow up if she received it eventually? No, I must say I, I couldn't just follow up. But I phoned the Ethel after two days, using my own spare time to check how are things, did they finally receive food, what was the situation now. And always, you'll always get a positive answer to say, no, for now, everything. Well, we're going to break away from the life SED Medi arbitration for now, but let's go back to court where judgment has earlier been handed down in the so-called Coffin case, but now we believe uh, that the prosecutor is making an application for parole. Let's go there live. <laughs> This application brought by the state, <coughs> we it's it's based on the, as Mr. Mulukwani said, out on the lack of remorse displayed by the accused persons, and further that he deemed them not to be candidates of rehabilitation. As the counsel for accused number two has already stated, we don't have psychological reports before us, but we still enjoy it by the act to consider the application brought by the, by the state. Uh, reference, I'll make reference to the case of state versus Mokwen and state versus Papir as well, and the attitude of the court in those matters. The, the Correctional Services Act makes provision for consideration of accused persons whilst in jail for, for uh, parole. But what's more <coughs> applicable in this matter, it's the matter of state versus Mutimkulu. Because in this uh, case, I've already ordered two sentences to run concurrently. And it wouldn't be prudent for this court to even grant the uh, application as requested by the state. And on that basis and basis alone, I'm going to refuse the application. Thank you. My lady, may I proceed with an application for the need to appeal in terms of section 316 of the criminal procedure act? You know it's in the appeal or you want to move it now? I want to move it now. You, you want to move the application, application for leave to appeal? <laughs> <laughs> Is you are well prepared. Mm -hmm. 
also handed an application, a copy of the application to my little friend. Maybe this is an admiration in terms of the provisions of section 316.1a uh, of Act 51 of 1977 for the to appeal, and in terms of section 3211b for the suspension of the execution of the sentence, and also in terms of the uh, provisions of the Criminal Procedure Act. Well, I, um, the Criminal Procedure Act provides that the reasons uh, for the appeal must be set up. And if I Well, there you have it. It's pictures frozen for now. We're going to see if we can sort out the technicalities. But in the interim, that is what the judge delivered. She denied the parole application by the accused. Ah, so more drama coming from the court there. We'll see if we can, that connect, can get that connection up and running again to bring you the latest from there. Let's see if it is up and running. Well, not as yet. So what we will do is let's go back now uh, to the arbitration process uh, here in Parktown of the life is a demand. Uh, entitled Ella 4. It's a schedule of the deceased which was prepared by the ombud. If you take a look at the first page of the document, the second column would be the name, the first name of the patient, of the deceased, the same name, the gender, ID number, and uh, all the way, and then you have the date of death. <coughs> Do you see that, those details? On top? Yes, the first one was on the 15, 1508, 2016. Date of death? No. Um, the, 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 the first name there is Rantodi Hendrik Mabua, mm -mm. who died on the 22nd of July 2016, on the first page. Uh, sorry, Councilor, on my first that, page. That is the life, uh, life is a many arbitration process here in Parktown, but as you know, uh, the court case, some drama there in Middleburg. Let's go back there live to find out what is the latest. What was said in his statement on the oath to the police, he had said that the police had told him what to put into his uh, statement. On, uh, my lady, the next point, paragraph five, it's also that respectfully that the learned judge further rejecting the evidence of the applicant. On the learned judge's opinion of applicants' demeanor demonstrated on the videos presented as evidence to the court, and the single alleged discrepancy between the evidence of the second applicant and his affidavit in support of his bail application, claiming whether uh, Mr. Malochwa, the complainant, was on the vehicle of accused number one or had not yet uh, gotten onto the vehicle at the time when the second accused arrived at the scene. The second point, my lady, uh, with respect, that the learned judge heard in rejecting the evidence of Mr. Maria, uh, the witness called on behalf of the uh, being the employee of Cartrack, and who evidenced, uh, who presented evidence about the whereabouts of the vehicles on the alert dates. And the next page, my lady, Paragraph 7, submitted so respectfully that the Lillian judge heard in holding that applicants acted unlawfully, despite the evidence that they were provoked by Mr. Blorchon at the time and that the retaliation was uh, within uh, the bounds acceptable. I just see there's a um, error in the typing there. It was within um, the acceptable ambit or limits which the society would find 
uh, acceptable under the circumstances. Are they in this battalion? So what, what are you referring to? Are you talking about self-defense or not? No, my lady, I'm talking about provocation. Okay. And more particularly the allegation that they were threatened. They intended to take, I'm talking about the accused, they intended to take the accused to the police station on the council. So what you're saying is that what they did was not unlawful? No, the, no. the provocation justifies the end result. The counter action. Okay. That's exactly what I mean. Thank you, it's noted. As you go to this then paragraph eight, we can state that the Lord Judge Fair is holding that the applicants act with the intention to kidnap the victim of Lord Shaw, with the intention to murder the victim of Lord Shaw, and with the required means they are under the circumstances. Paragraph 9, my lady, it's something to respect that the Lord Judge Fair in convicting the applicants on attempted murder despite the absence of any proof about an attempt by either of the applicants to murder the victim of Lord Shaw or any other person for that matter. <coughs> Paragraph 10, my lady, it's of a respect to that the Linda judge heard in finding that the evidence warranted the conviction on assault with intent to do this bodily harm, inter alia on the grounds that the evidence by the state witnesses in support was gainsaid by the object of established facts, such as the Medica legal report, the videos, and so on. My lady, on page over with paragraph 11. It submitted with respect that the learned judge did in finding that the evidence warranted a conviction, conviction on kidnapping with the alien on the grounds that kidnapping forms an integral part of the threat and cannot be dissected without splitting of charges. It seems like we haven't got a very stable link there from the Middleburg Court High Court. We're going to see if we can establish it for you and we see if we're, we can bring you the latest. As you know, of course, uh, sentencing uh, was handed down a little bit earlier. The two accused, uh, of course, were sentenced. Uh, that was Theo Jackson as well as Willem Oosthuizen, and they concluded that their submissions on Monday and each of them, well, between the two of them, 11 and 14 years. That uh, was what they received. Now, as you know, that judgment has been handed down in the so-called Coffin Assault case in the High Court sitting in Middleburg this morning. Judge Sejo Poche Mbasele has uh, sentenced Willem Oosthuizen and Theo Martin Jackson respectively to 11 and 14 years imprisonment at the Middleburg High Court. Now, the two, as you can recall, if I have to take you back, force victim Lochwa into a coffin and threaten to set it alight last year. Sentence imposed in respect of count four is ordered to run concurrently with the one imposed in respect of count five. Uh, count four is count five. Accused number one, you are hereby sentenced to 16 years imprisonment. Five, of, five years of which is suspended for a period of eight years on condition that you are not found guilty of any offenses, of the offenses you convicted of during the period of suspension. You are effectively sentenced to 11 years direct imprisonment. Accused number two, you are hereby sentenced to 19 years imprisonment, five years of which is suspended for a period of eight years on condition that you are not found guilty of any offenses you convicted of during the period of suspension. You are effectively sentenced to 14 years direct imprisonment. Accordingly, your bail is hereby revoked. Well, that is what happened earlier. Let's now go back to the Middleburg High Court where the application for parole is underway. So I'm going to respectfully that the learned judge overemphasized the aggravating factors, did not take the applicant's personal circumstances and extenuating factors properly into account, 
the approach over to paragraph 4, my lady. Um, that the complainant did not prove any serious injuries and no expert evidence was led to any psychological damage uh, pertaining to either of the uh, complainants, and more particularly, my lady, the severe or the theory of contradiction by the state witnesses pertaining to the injuries of the complainants. We will report <coughs> with respect to evidence from Mr. Lordshaw's mother, who saw him immediately after the incident. She uh, knows her son best, and according to her, she thought he had only a headache. She didn't witness any, any injury. Did he testify about extensive injuries, my lady? Mr. Gibbs, if I remember well, I specifically mentioned that I had no evidence on the extent of the injuries. I even mentioned the evidence, the, the extent to which the evidence of the medical practitioner failed to corroborate. So I failed to appreciate what you're raising here now. Because that doesn't nullify the, the, char the conviction as well. The extent of the injuries, I have to take it into account when I pass the sentence. And I specifically mentioned in my judgment that I took that into account. That I didn't have proof, and what the medical practitioner said. I'm not trying to defend myself. I just want to appreciate what point are you trying to put forward here. Oh, my lady, in particular, there was no evidence presented on any psychological damage from either. Even whether psychological, or physical, I didn't have any evidence, that's good. and that's what I said in my judgment. That is so. Thank you. Right, my lady, point, third, uh, point five, the third point is submitted respectfully that the sentence is shockingly inappropriate. Point six, submitted with respect that the media coverage and public attendance or support and over emphasis of the perceived interest of the section of society. And finally, the punishment, inter alia, in the light of the lack of any further injuries, <coughs> is not congruent with similar and even worse incidents punished by courts on a daily basis in the RSA in the public abuse model and impression of and overset emphasis on general returns. My lady, those are the submissions pertaining to the application for leave to appeal and from accused on number one side. Um, the aspect of the suspension of the uh, execution of the sentence, perhaps I should leave that for a moment and allow my little friend to address the court on point 12, um, the issue pertaining to only accused number two and um, on the conviction on the count of obstructing or defeating the ends of justice. Mr. Bassan, thank you, Mr. Akis. Mr. Court, please, my lady, I'm, as I said previously, I'm not going to speak simply for hearing my own voice. I agree with Mr. Gibson. You will notice that it's a joint application for me to appeal. That's just on paragraph 12, my lady. Your ladyship will remember when Mr. De Beer testified in Delmas. He admitted under oath that he did not tell the truth in his statement to the police. And although he initially in his evidence in chief made no mention of this and tried to apportion blame for the destroyal of the coffin of the accused number two only, he admitted under oath that he gave the instruction for the coffin to be uh, destroyed. And I'm not going to repeat the words that was actually used, but it amounted to swear words. And the fact of the matter is that there could have been no things real with accused number two, I would submit, to destroy the coffin to defeat the course of justice, because this happened prior to the video going viral, or there, any, or there being any intimation that criminal proceedings was instituted or was about to be instituted. That's the aspect as far as point 12 is concerned. And I would respectfully submit that would warrant the attention of another court. Um, as a last uh, point, my lady, and I also I always regard this as extremely important. Your ladyship will remember that Mr. Fotswa 
testified that he was going for counselling, but he could initially not say whether it was with a male or a female. He couldn't remember the person's name nor where the officers are. And I would submit that the evidence given by Mr. Mpotswa for aggravation of sentence should in any event be disregarded. I've got nothing further to add unless there's something specific you want to That's the court. Thank you. Thank you. The state is of the view that with the evidence presented before court, any other court will never come to a different conclusion than what this court has come up to. The evidence is quite clear. To any other person, I'm going to start with a question. It's 1100 hours Central Africa time on this Friday, the 27th of October. Good morning, Jumbo Africa, and a very warm welcome. Now, this is Newsroom. I'm Elvis Preston. I'll be with you until 12 o'clock. Now, today we focus on the life of the late former ANC president, Oliver Reginald Tumbo, who would have turned a century. That's 100 years today. So that's why we're asking you, what do you think we can learn from the legacy of the life of Oliver Tumbo? That's the question that we pose to you. Uh, let's uh, take a look uh, if there is any comments in relation to that that we can put up for you. Um, let's see what you are telling us about the life of Oliver Tumbo. Well, we, uh, we seem to have lost it somewhere, but we continue also with uh, our poll that, of course, we're looking at the German software giant SAP that has confirmed paying 107 million rand to companies that were linked to the Gupta families. And that's why we're asking you the question on the poll, following that admission and the apology by SAP, is it not time? And why is the poll not up? That the Hawks investigate the Gupta links. Well, there you have it. There is your numbers, 186. 90% are saying yes, 10% are saying no. We'll read those comments in a short while, but right now let's take a look at your news headlines. The two coffin accused, Willem Oosthuizen and Theo Martins Jackson, have been sentenced to 11 and 14 years imprisonment, respectively. Today, South Africa marks the centenary celebrations of the late ANC president, Oliver Reginald Tumbo. And police say about six prisoners have escaped from the privately operated uh, Kutama Sintumile prison in Louis Trichardt in Limpopo, where there is a work stoppage by the workers. Those are your headlines, but our top story this hour. The late former ANC president, Oliver Reginald Tambo, would have turned 100 years today. And in Bizana, in the Eastern Cape, it will be a hive of activity ahead of the centenary celebrations there. The festivities will be accompanied by service delivery projects such as housing, roads, water supply, as well as a new computer lab for special needs. Let's now go to our reporter, Evie Wepoti. Welcome back. We are inside the tent here at Ngandolo where the celebrations of Tata Oartambo are being held. We must allude to the fact that this was an international statesman who did nothing but carry the liberation of South Africa to the democracy that we have right now. The longest standing president of the ANC and as well as, you know, some of the characteristics to identify him was a unifier, a very humble man, but a great leader. I think most important and very close to his heart, his community. So we're going to speak to community members just to find out what exactly uh, does this celebration mean to them and what do they know of Utata or Tambo. Sasbulsela Kuni Tata, Sikaluni Musa and Jangabanavala Panam Tanja Bazo Biozela, the meaning Ulukanga Kakatata or Tambo. Singati Umsambi Uzivanja, Nuena, why is Indonos as the young Elikawis of Piazanganam Tanja? Ninga Kulu is as the young Tambo. 
Well, definitely, and it's very cold this morning, but everyone here is very friendly, very nice towards us. But let's also speak to the youth. Uh, we've got some youth members here who are at the OR Tambo Technical School. Find out a bit more in terms of being part of the youth system. And the Definitely, I think um, a bit more in terms of the lectures that are happening, a lot of people that are around here, I think the youth, what they've learned, what they're finding out. Zivano Abilan will sugar and Sanjel and Pios and Gatatu Tambo. Utatu Tambo, whom to all sense and I could live. Since JJ Mutam, Oguza, who be called scholars as old Oliver Tam, Gogo, Basakula, Kum Dong Tam. Tetekam Nand, Tetekam Nandi Kakulu. Nina, Zindonina, and his Tanda, um, got out alone or Tambo, Wayne Kokeli, Okuma Abagana, Nifunaku. Utata or Tambo. Definitely hearing from the community members telling us that oh, Oliver Tambo wasn't only a statesman to the remainder of us, but a father to this community and they will always and forever be grateful for the struggle and the liberation that he carried on his shoulders. But I think for now it's back to you guys in studio. The ANC has declared 2017 to be the year of O.R. Tambo and has throughout the year driven a series of campaigns to draw attention to his illustrious legacy. Now many remember nostalgically the days of O.R. as he was affectionately known. Now one of them was Lindiwe Mabuza who joined the ANC in the 1970s and she soon developed a very close relationship with O.R. She called him Booty, meaning brother. She was a radio journalist and broadcaster in Radio Freedom, which was the ANC's radio station. Now, O.R. often used this platform to send out his messages to the party. In 1977, Mabuza became editor of a feminist journal, Voice of Women within the ANC. She's also a former ANC chief representative to the Scandinavian ambassador. Ms. Mabuza now joins us on the line in our Pretoria studios, rather, to talk about the life and times of O.R. Tambo. Very good morning to you, ma'am, and welcome. What memories do you have of the man who kept the liberation light burning while other leaders were jailed or either banned? Lots of memories. I have a memory of O.R., the most humble leader I ever came across. O.R., the most extraordinary, passionate, lover of his people, or the, the commander-in-chief of 
Mukonto Wesizwe, who are the supreme diplomat that South Africa ever had. How did Owar Tambo carry out that mandate that uh, he was bestowed on to establish the ANC's foreign mission? He carried it on because, oh, I think, basically, he was a deeply spiritual man. He may not have gone to church every day, but he believed strongly in his divine creator. He communicated with him every day of his life. I think he also did it by making friends wherever he went. You will remember that one of the greatest friends South Africa had in the UK was Father Trevor Hettleston. And that's how the anti-apartheid movement in the UK started, which spread throughout the world. He made friends with people like Olof Palme, the prime minister of Sweden, before he even was a prime minister. He was so close to him and his family, with Lisbeth Palme, his wife. Mm. He made friends even with people who were against the ANC. He brought everybody close to the ANC. Because I think of his power of conviction, because of his wisdom, because of his energy, because of his eloquence, all of these qualities stood as well in the leadership of Oliver Tambo. Um, by having these friends around the world, he was able to then also place his trust in their hands. I remember Reddy of the United Nations, whom O.R. called my brother. He believed in the ability of Reddy to help him within the United Nations system. To, to push the United Nations to a position where the, the apartheid regime was actually expelled in the 1970s from the United Nations. They lost their credentials because of the power that OR had over people. Some people in the world, I know the Swedes, uh, a Swedish foreign minister uh, who's not with us now, Stian Andersen, said, you know, OR, Oliver Tambo is a president of presidents. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely wonderful. Now, let's talk about you. You also worked as a radio journalist and broadcaster for Radio Freedom. How important was that station to the African National Congress? For we understand that OR used it to disseminate information through the station. It was absolutely critical because OR was banned in South Africa. It could not be quoted. It could not be seen. But through, the, through Radio Freedom, people could hear him. Uh, and I know that people were listening to that. Some people would tell us that they ran home to, to their friends who had uh, shortwave radios to be able to listen to the voice of OR or the voice of the ANC on Radio Freedom. It was such a privilege for us to be able to work with OR, the master of language, the master of politics. And he, he taught us so many lessons in um, leadership, the quality of leadership, the integrity that is expected of leaders, uh, the compassion in him almost exuded, exuded into people around him because he was such a genuine a freedom fighter. He was such a, a, convic a convinced revolutionary. There were lots of interviews we did with OR, uh, but or when he was on Radio Freedom, he preferred that he just talks to the people of South Africa that, rather than be interviewed. Of course, we were with him around the world as he carried out these interviews. I think I did probably one or two, two or three interviews with him. But that's not as important as the statements that he was making on his own, being interviewed by world journalists. I was only a little fish in this uh, uh, <laughs> pond of journalism. <laughs> but when you had the BBC interviewing OR, and you saw how resolute he was, how convincing he was, it, it was just a pleasure and a joy to, to be part of that team of OR. Um, as he was confronting very difficult questions, questions of why are you op cooperating with the communists? Mm -hmm. And 
we learned a lot or are telling the world that the communists were some of the first people who agreed with us in our struggle and who formed an alliance with us in the struggle for liberation. Communists had died alongside with us in the struggle. And the other problem that uh, uh, journalists would always see was, why do you carry on with this armed struggle? And I mean, I don't have to tell the people of South Africa why we decided to, to form MK, but the, the boot of the, of, of the regime was so heavy on the necks of our people. What option do you have? but to carry on a struggle that will get rid of the, of the monster that was oppressive. And I think that uh, OR was such a good, eloquent representative of the people of South Africa that he was able in the 30 years, over 30 years he was outside the country to win the entire world. He left South Africa with only a suitcase he came back with millions of people supporting <laughs> us and being, having been part of this struggle. Yeah. I mean, I don't know anybody anywhere in the world who has that capacity and ability to win an entire globe, East and West, uh, all kinds of religious uh, beliefs were supportive of our struggle for liberation. In closing, how would you remember our tumble? You know, I try as a writer to write about OR, and I also persuade other writers and people who haven't written at all to write about OR. Right now, I'm editing a book of letters to Uncle OR by people who were children under him. I think it's a way of remembering him. It's permanent. It will go down in history forever as a testament of the value that OR was to all the people, including children. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much for joining us in our Pretoria studios. Parliament as a legislative body could do, go a long way in continuing to promote um, women's rights in uh, all African member states. Moon will be elected president. A decisive win by him will provide much needed stability in South Korea. The Deputy President and the SADC Oversight Committee have been mandated to convene a multi-stakeholder national dialogue before election. Five teams are trapped in the relegation mud. These include Bloemfontein Celtic, 12th on the lock, followed by Chipa United, Free State Stars and Baroka, who are second from the bottom, as well as Highlands Park, who have won only four matches. We are on point with breaking stories, detailed economy and sport. Tune in to Midday Report every Monday to Friday from 12 p.m. We remember Oliver Reginald Tumbo. Now, Luli Kalaninos is, uh, Kalanikos rather, is a social historian. She's a lecturer and esteemed scholar. Her activism in the liberation struggle began in her youth as a member of the Congress of Democrats, a lifelong educator. She taught English literacy to workers of the South African Congress of Trade Unions. She also contributed to the journal Fighting Talk which was edited by Ruth First. You remember her? Now, Luli also have written a book titled Oliver Tumbo, Beyond the Ngeli Mountains. Luli is here uh, joining us in studio. Very good morning to you, ma'am, and welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Elvis. First and foremostly, as a biographer, what is it that we as South Africans should remember about Oliver Reginald Tumbo? So much has been said at last mm -hmm. about O.R. in this year of his centenary. And so many good and inspiring memories about him. Um, and 
I feel that the reason that we've had such rich uh, memories and observations are because he was what I'd say a leader for all seasons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, during apartheid, the, the, the worldwide struggle, he made it an international struggle, winning the support of East and West eventually. Yes. Um, his enormous empathy, his high intelligence, and yet at the same time, mm. using indigenous methods of leadership. Mm. In other words, the collective um, consensus decision-making, inclusiveness, and above all, listening, genuine listening, not just pretending to listen. Mm being the last to speak because he wanted to gather the wisdom of everyone he spoke to. Yes. Um, so that approach, as well as, of course, his high intelligence and knowledge of science, um, Western science, um, I have to just mention that he originally wanted to be a doctor, mm -hmm. a medical doctor, and the reason was that he wanted to research indigenous knowledge, medical knowledge, and make a contribution to the West and alert the world to the, the knowledge of Africa. I tell you. And, so and had, what changed his mind? Oh, well, it was imposed on him. Mm. He applied, it was uh, in 1938, mm. in the 30s, when he applied to Witz, medical school i think it was the only one at the time mm -hmm. and they turned him down because he was african mm. and they said we can't have black people dissecting white uh, um, the corpses mm -hmm. you know which is bizarre thinking mm -hmm. um, so he then decided they offered him a four-year course called uh, medical aid mm. and he wasn't prepared to settle for that yes so then he went to Fort Hare and uh, got his uh, science degree mm -hmm. instead now tell us about the book beyond the Engeli mountains where does, does the title stem from um, O.R. himself asked me to call it that. Mm. Of course, he didn't live to see the, the biography. And the reason is that he's, when he, in his memoirs, he talks about how he used to stand um, outside his little home in Encantolo, and he'd see the range of mountains in the distance, the Ngeli Mountains. And he used to wonder, what is on the other side? Um, and he would love to find out. And, of course, he found out in a big way <laughs> what was on the other side. What was the big way? The big way was, well, the first time he crossed it, he, he went to school, boarding school at St. Peter's, where he got the foundations of his, um, his uh, education and his science knowledge. Um, but the big way also was that he went to Johannesburg, a whole new world of politics opened up for him. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, he went out to the, into the world for 30 years, mm -hmm. you know, struggling, fighting for the rest of the world mm -hmm. to be sensitized to the horrors of apartheid mm -hmm. and also to the talent and ability Mm -hmm. of the African people throughout the continent. Encapsulate for us that mission that he went on abroad for the African National Congress in order to fight the apartheid or the then apartheid government. Yes. Well, when he first went, um, he, he was basically a diplomat mm. to alert the world to what was happening inside South Africa. Um, and one thing that he had, one policy that he had in mind that in the long run was very effective was the economic boycott. Um, he urged countries to boycott apartheid South African goods, mm. 
because they were doing a brisk trade, you know, the apartheid um, uh, government had enormous uh, income from, from outside. Mm. So that was, that was the first few years. He also spoke at the United Nations during the Rivonia trial when um, Mandela, Susulu, Mbeki and others uh, were on trial for their lives and they were they expected to get a death sentence. He spoke at United Nations and told them what it was, why they, they were prepared to die for mm. the struggle. And then, of course, after that, soon after Lutuli, Chief Lutuli got the Nobel Peace Prize, where he made the most inspiring speech, a few days later, MK announces that it's time to fight back through armed struggle. Mm -hmm. So he had to then encapsulate that. Mm -hmm. And, I, I, you know, in essence, what he did was he pulled together all the strands of, of um, possible ways of fighting together. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he, he conceived of the four pillars of struggle, mm -hmm. which was... Um, uh, armed struggle, the masses, I should, shouldn't put armed first, the mm. masses, the underground, armed struggle, and the international support. Mm -hmm. And he argued to the very end that you couldn't foreground the one with the other. They were interrelated. Mm -hmm. Typical of holistic thinking of an indigenous form where you don't put things in silos, they interact. Mm -hmm. And I think that is why we can learn today mm -hmm. from that approach. I asked the question earlier, was <coughs> he for war and was he for a violent struggle? But what you are suggesting is that there was an integrated approach that he approached. Yes, mm -hmm. they were inseparable mm -hmm. in a way because the dignity of oppressed people was asserted by calling for armed struggle. Mm -hmm. He acknowledged that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> to go to war or not to go to war, and ultimately, what then transpired? Do, do you focus on that in, in the biography? Well, um, he emphasized, and of course I explore that, um, armed struggle as a form of propaganda, so that uh, people were afraid of armed struggle. Mm -hmm. And there were one or two examples, of course. One of them is the uh, bombing of the um, petrol, uh, uh, mm -hmm. it, yes, in Sasselberg, which was, had a huge, sent a big message. Mm -hmm. um, in reality, I suppose you could say that there was very little of armed struggle mm -hmm. relatively to, to other countries. Mm -hmm. And um, that probably would have, might have relieved OR. Mm -hmm. um, and of course he had problems with cadres who were impatient mm -hmm. to go home. They felt they were rotting in the camps and they wanted to go home and fight. Mm -hmm. And he had to deal with that as well. Now, <coughs> just in conclusion, less yes. than 30 okay. seconds. Okay. I asked the question earlier to the minister, what would he say today? You spend a lot of time with him in writing the biography. What would he say today to South Africans? I have to remember, mm -hmm. I have to quote his mm -hmm. first speech when he returned from, from exile and he said, um, I come back bringing the movement intact, much, much bigger and um, this is the movement that I hand over to you. Guard our special movement. Wonderful. Really. I thank you so much for your time and joining thank us you. here in studio. Thank that you. was the author of Oliver Tumbo's biography, Beyond the Ngeli Mountains, social historian, lecturer, and esteemed scholar, Luli Kalalinos. Kalanikos, let me get that right.
violence against women, it also talks to such behavior where teachers, instead of educating kids and give them dignity, they strip them of their dignity. The first lady. The first lady, her action, it's just unacceptable. I must say that it cannot be condoned. If I had it my way, I would say we had to act and make sure that he goes to jail. The scourge is not seizing. The angry people, the intolerant, it's so huge. So then that the scourge finds itself within that particular environment. You cannot uh, say that it, it, it's a standalone. Mm -hmm. It's influenced by social ills, economic challenges. Join me in Port Sedu live every Monday to Thursday at 17.30. The life of an icon in pictures. He was a towering intellect and a great diplomat. Unfortunately, he died in 1993 and never saw the transition to democracy. Watch SABC News Channel 404 on Thursday at 9 p.m. Zoli Leng Kakani, MK veteran and the former Inspector General of Intelligence, began his career as a political activist and a member of the African National Congress in 1958 at the University of Fort Hare. Now, while studying at Fort Hare, he was directed by the ANC to go into exile to pursue further studies and undertake military, military training, where he met O.R. Tambo in Tanzania. He subsequently went to Lusaka where he held various positions, uh, various positions rather, and worked alongside OR. Now for more on this, we're joined in our Pretoria studios by Zolile Nkakani. A very good morning to you, sir, and welcome. Good morning, and thanks to your listeners. First and foremost, I want you to reflect back to those many years when you went into exile and spent some time with OR Tambo. Tell us more about your journey and when you first met him. Yes, I left South Africa in 1962. Mm -hmm. We left for the Soviet Union then to do undertake studies. We studied, I studied for chemical engineering. Uh, Completing my studies, I went for military training, and after that was deployed in Tanzania at Congo camp. From Congo camp in Tanzania, I then went to Lusaka, the headquarters of MK. And there I had the privilege to work under O.R. Tambo. Now, this was really a privilege to me because O.R. Tambo was a very learned person, but he was an all-rounded human being. Around him, you felt comfortable. He was not intimidating. And I think his background in teaching helped him also pass on his knowledge, his vast knowledge, to, to you as you worked with him. He was a very humble man, but he was a man who was able to, I believe, get the best out of you. He was a very respected leader. As I said, an all-rounded person mm -hmm. who was firm, but really was gentle and very considerate in the work. Yeah. Some would say that he was firm and fair, but o they also said, and of course we had a number of interviews during the course of, of the week, that he was a workaholic. He worked seven days a week. What would you say to us about his work ethic and how it influenced you? Oh, he was a very hard worker. Uh, and I think, you know, on his shoulders, as everybody will tell you, that O.R. is the one who kept the ANC together under very difficult 
conditions. And therefore, I think his hard work paid off because we also felt that we had to do likewise. We couldn't, you know, slack because the task was very difficult. Remember in those days, uh, whilst in, in Lusaka, uh, Southern Rhodesia was not free. Uh, so to accomplish sending back trained uh, MK cadres to South Africa was a huge task. Mm -hmm. Even inside the country at, the, at that time, after the internal leadership had been arrested, they, it was difficult sending someone to South Africa when you didn't have any people to receive them. So we had actually to start from scratch. And OR had to make sure that he mobilizes uh, international support for the efforts that we are doing, both in terms of hardware as well as making an understanding of what, where the ANC stands. In Africa, a lot of work had to, to be done because the ANC sometimes was not understood because the Africanist, Pan-Africanist view was more receptive to them. So mm -hmm. it was hard work to convince the uh, African uh, leadership that ANC had a role to play in the liberation of South African struggle. Mm -hmm. Now, during the liberation struggle, it wasn't all plain sailing because I want to take you back to the Mogorogoro conference in 1958, or 59 rather, where the leadership of OR was, uh, was questioned, so to speak. But can you reflect on that situation at that point in time? Uh, I wouldn't say that the leadership of OR was questioned. As I said, at that time we were passing through, it was a very hard phase. Mm. Um, the memorandum that was put out by uh, a number of our ANC cadres returning from prison in, in Botswana raised very pertinent issues about the direction in which we were going, also about the culture that had, what that was at the time afflict, afflicting the ANC. And therefore, OR played a very prominent role in ensuring that there was overall consultation, not consultation not only in the African theater, but also of all ANC members and cadres who were scattered all over the world. And also uh, attempts were made to make sure that there is adequate consultation with our internal machinery. So the Morogoro Conference, remember, couldn't represent all the people of South Africa. We had only the MK cadres who were outside there and some of the ANC entities that were spread all over the world. And yet we had to go to a conference in which momentous decisions were going to be made. It was an elective conference. And OR, you know, going to the camps to listen to what the cadres there were complaining about, but also what contribution they wanted what direction they wanted the organization to take. He, you, and, and they, were, they were talking to him, and he was listening to them, and there were no holes barred. All uh, issues were on the table, and OR had to go through that. Mm -hmm. At the conference itself, what, what, what happened is that after the, the, as the program went and it reached the situation, uh, the, the stage where elections had to take place, OR himself indicated that he was not available for election. Wow, you should have seen <laughs> what impact that had on us. Who were we, a small group, to 
to change you know what the people of South Africa had, had done. It was a very difficult thing to do. Mm -hmm. But our elders who were there, Uncle JB, Max, um, Moses Kotani, Abida, they went and s talked to him. And he came back and stood for elections. And he was elected unanimously. Mm -hmm. So it was not a question of questioning OR's leadership. Yes. It was a question of making sure that some of the changes that the Kailas wanted. For instance, we wanted the ANC now to open up its membership to all South Africans, not only to uh, Africans, black Africans, but also to the colored organizations, the Indians, the white, could become full members of the ANC, so that the ANC, in representing the alliance, could, could do so effectively, and the membership could participate in the affairs of the organization inside. And well, also, the strategy and tactics of the way forward was also mapped out. And then finally, sir, do you think that that was his dream, to see a united South Africa? And, of course, how should South Africans, in general, remember O.R. Tambo? Yes, I think O.R. wanted to see a unite at South Africa. And I think where he is, it's appropriate that in celebrating his 100th year anniversary, we should heed his call. You know, the call that I think today OR would have made to all of us would go something like, all of us should make the RSA eminently governable. That it is a task for all of us to make the RSA eminently governed for achieving, or the purpose for achieving sustainable social economic liberation for all in our life lifetime. I am sure he would indicate that it is urgent that that task should be made and fulfilled, and it should be carried by all of us. My good sir, I thank you so much for being with us today and giving us your message to South Africans. Thank you. That was Zolile Mkagani. He is an MK veteran and a former Inspector General of Intelligence reflecting on the life and times of Oliver Tumbo. Oliver Reginald Tumbo. We are focusing on Oliver Reginald Tumbo, former president of the African National Congress. Now, Dr. Kingsley Makubele, who is also OR's bodyguard rather in exile, described him as a negotiator and a man thoroughly committed to the struggle. Now, this, as on this Friday coming, it will mark the centenary of Tumbo's birth. Dr. Makubele had a close relationship with Tumbo and often referred to him as a father. Joining us now in studio, we're so glad to have Dr. Kingsley Mokobella, the brand South Africa CEO. A very good morning to you, sir, and welcome. Good morning, Elvis. I want to take you back and tell us about your relationship with O.R. Tumbo, because you were very close. You were his personal bodyguard. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, my relationship with uh, O.R. was essentially to look after him. Mm -hmm. I had an odious <coughs> responsibility to ensure that uh, he gets his day together. And that on a daily basis, he does things that he needed to do. He takes his medication mm -hmm. and, and, and he prepares for the next meeting, prepares for the office. He has everything that he needed for his meetings, mm -hmm. over and, and above uh, looking after his physical well-being. Mm -hmm. The smaller details or the minor details that people say is his personality. What sort of person was he to you? Because you, you said he's, he was almost like a father to you. Well, he... He had a very strong personality. Mm. Uh, never exposes his emotions unnecessarily. I don't remember seeing O.R. angry. Mm. I've seen him very disappointed when uh, people are, <clears throat> are massacred back home. I could see he, he had this sense of loss. Mm. 
And, and because of, uh, remember, I was sent abroad to go and pursue the arms struggle from abroad. Mm. So he had this sense of feeling that he had to liberate all the people in the country. Each time there were sad incidents, it would affect him. Yeah. Uh, but I've never seen him angry. Mm. Ironically. Mm. How many years were you together and, and did you travel around the globe? With oh, we traveled mm. around the world together. I, I had the opportunity to travel with him mm. uh, to Western Sahara, to Moscow, mm. Western Europe. So we've done a lot of trips together. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. In that period, um, working with him, what sort of lessons did you gain and what sort of lessons can South Africa learn from his life? I think the most important thing was his sense of commitment. Mm. Um, the man worked Monday to Monday, mm. um, and, and he would rationalize that. He would say, there are people who are in prison that are waiting for us to liberate them. Mm -hmm. and, and that's why he would feel a sense of duty mm -hmm. on a daily basis to do something towards the liberation of those people who are in jail, mm -hmm. towards alleviating uh, all the pressures that people were facing in the country, the massacres that are happening, the state of emergency that was in the country. So it kind of curtailed even his own free time mm -hmm. that he would spend every minute of his time for the liberation of the people of South Africa. That's, that's the type of a person he was. With so many travels and, and so many duties on his, on his shoulders, he probably missed his family quite a lot. Actually, we, we would fly from Moscow mm -hmm. and, and spend the a night in London, and after that, we we'll fly to Lusaka. Mm. Uh, because uh, back in Lusaka, it was the head office of the ANC. He mm. needed to do a lot of work. So, mm. and, and I think the family understood that, and they gave him a lot of support to that effect. Mm. And, and, and I think one thing that one learns from that, if you have a very strong family backing you in what you're doing, mm. you are likely to succeed. So he was completely committed to the struggle? Oh, he was. Mm -hmm. He lived. Uh, the struggle throughout. Mm -hmm. Talking about the travels and the time that you spent with him, at any time, was his life in danger? His life was always in danger. Remember, he was enemy number one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there were instances that uh, our intelligence would tell us that uh, there are commandos uh, in Lusaka looking for OR to assassinate him, would beef up the security. Mm -hmm. But we always uh, knew that his life was always in danger, mm -hmm. no doubt about that. What sort of backup did you utilize? Did, was there any intelligence services that provided oh, you Oh, we worked together with the Zambians. We, mm -hmm. we had a very strong MK presence always that would provide mm -hmm. a lot of backup. Mm -hmm. So we were self-sufficient in terms of the protection of our leadership. Not only around OR, around the whole mm -hmm. leadership of the ANC yeah. at that time. Now, we're celebrating his life and times this entire week, of course, the build-up to the centenary celebrations on Friday. But as South Africans, how should we remember OR Tambo? I think we should, we should honor OR Tambo by strengthening our institutions of governance, building the capacity of the state. Mm -hmm. Because OR understood that a strong state will be able to deliver the goods to all South Africans. And I'm saying building the capacity of the state is not only the responsibility of government, the civil society, business, to ensure that we build a state that is strong, it's able to deliver the common goods that we all look forward to. Mm -hmm. And I think to alleviate poverty and provide education to most South Africans, mm -hmm. by doing that, we'll be honoring the memory and the legacy of Oliver Temple. Doctor, I thank you so much for your time and all the best of luck in the future. Thanks. That was Dr. Kingsley Mokubela. A little bit of Oar Tambo's life that he spent with him. He's the brand South Africa CEO in studio. The life of an icon in pictures he was a towering intellect and a great diplomat. Unfortunately, he died in 1993 and never saw the transition to democracy. Watch SABC News Channel 404 on Thursday at 9 p.m. A lot of us rely on tech to survive and Africa is already a mobile-first continent. 
We build a mobile technology that connects motorcycle taxis to commuters and businesses in real time. My phone was the, the most important thing. Africans are using technology to innovate. On network, we have African technology and social media news. Even robots have heard about us. Hello, watch network on SIBC. For African technology and social media news, join Ms. Pumela Lezondi on network every Sunday at 9 p.m. I actually never realized there was a distinction between me and his children. Uh, his children, they, they lived in, in the UK, uh, but each time we go there, we were all like a family. Um, and when we would go to London, I remember, because Tembi was married, she was no longer living in the family house, and I would sleep in Tembi's room. And Tembi's room was just next door to O.R.'s room. Uh, Zelani and Dali had uh, a room on the upper floor, but on the family floor there was a room that would span. But there was no difference between his children and, and me. And not only me, but even uh, part of my team, uh, we were like a family. We would sit around the table, have a meal, all of us, and we would sit around the table sometimes and, and rejoice about a host of things. Um, uh, very interesting, sometimes we'll spend Christmas in London and uh, he would dance walls with Zelani. And I did not realize what was a good dancer. And, and so we were like a big family. I still believe that the best attribute of a leader is to listen to concerns of people that you're leading and be able to internalize, not necessarily provide answers immediately, but listen to what people are saying and internalize that. OR had those kind of attributes, and I think that was a good defining moment for him to be able to listen to the entire membership of the ANC and internalize these issues and develop strategies that would help the organization to move forward. He was quite good in that. And that's why he was able to keep the movement together even during the most difficult times, because he was able to listen to people's views. But it was easy to persuade. Good reasons would persuade OR in any way. <laughs> Handel Messiah was his favorite song, and, and the, the battle hymn of the Republic mm -hmm. uh, was his uh, other song. He would play the battle hymn of the Republic uh, early in the morning, before he wakes up with a small tape and he would uh, open the entire sound. And ironically, some of us who worked with him, we, we then got influenced by this kind of music. But he had a, an array of collection of classical music. Um, uh, Bach, he listened to Bach, he listened to, to Mozart, um, and, and um, a, a host of collections, but he was a big fan of choral music. I don't think um, general people here understand the magnitude of his contribution. I don't think so. And I think um, it will be useful now that we're celebrating his centenary anniversary to really speak more about the attribute of the man and how he contributed to the liberation of South Africa. I find a lot of things people don't understand. Uh, the other day I was talking to the Apartheid Museum about OR and, and my talk was around the Harare Declaration, which became a blueprint for negotiations here in South Africa. And I was really astonished to realize most people did not realize that this is a document that OR worked on it, that he devised himself that would help the future negotiation basis, would form the basis of future negotiations in South Africa. So I think there's more that 
people who have worked with Warivin during the 60s can talk about the attributes of the man and be able to share this knowledge with everyone. It would, it would really help a, a lot of us uh, to aspire to be like him. He had a strong sense of what has been called the art of the possible. Um, step by step, the long-term haul. And the big demand here was not to lose sight of that final prize. I was deeply struck by his calm, quiet dignity, and also by a, a very beautiful face, you know, um, just at peace with himself in a way, and also the scars, the traditional scars, and yet he was wearing a suit, and that for me summed up this whole person, an African bearing his tradition and yet having mastered the skills of the West, which he was now using against the colonizers. The Pan-African Parliament, as a legislative body, could do, go a long way in continuing to promote um, women's rights in uh, all African member states. Moon will be elected president. A decisive win by him will provide much-needed stability in South Korea. The Deputy President and the SADC Oversight Committee have been mandated to convene a multi-stakeholder national dialogue before election. Five teams are trapped in the relegation mud. These include Bloemfontein Celtic, 12th on the lock, followed by Chiba United, Free State Stars and Baroka, who are second from the bottom, as well as Highlands Park, who have won only four matches. We're on point with breaking stories, detailed economy and sport. Tune in to Midday Report every Monday to Friday from 12 p.m. We make sure to be where news is happening, both locally and globally. For the latest business news, stay with us. From South Africa to the world, we've got all your latest sporting news. Don't miss our weather updates at every hour. Stay tuned to News Today, Monday to Friday, from 3 to 5.30 p.m. here on ACBC News. Oliver Tambo understood and articulated it in a number of occasions, the fact that we need to prepare ourselves for a period in which we would be able to play a meaningful role in South Africa. He's the first person I heard speak about the reconstruction and development of South Africa as early as 1980, saying prepare ourselves to reconstruct and develop South Africa after liberation. That was the trust of Somafco, to give South African youth the opportunity to further their studies, to acquire skills, and then of course to ready themselves to come play a meaningful role in South Africa. It was always a great occasion to meet the, the president of the ANC at the time, Owar. He visited Somafco a few times while we were there before we went to Europe, and uh, Owar would uh, participate, virtually participate in the, in the cultural activities. I remember the moment where I would come in uh, in the, the Hector Peterson Hall 
that were built where we held our cultural events and they listen to the choir and they listen and watch us uh, uh, dance, do traditional dance and poetry. And at one moment he just stood up and decided to conduct the choir himself. It was, that was beautiful. And over, always, and I've met him a few times in Europe, whenever he had an opportunity coming out in Europe, he would always make it a business, his business, to invite students and we would want to know what we're doing. Great lover of music, Or I mean, the African National Congress established a, a cultural ensemble called Amanda Cultural Ensemble, and that was one of our proudest uh, products, I believe. And he, there were and there are a number of videos where you would find Or in Sweden, and Amanda would be performing there. And uh, he understood the power of culture and the power of music as a mobilization tool to inform the world and to expose the South African culture, OR, always, always uh, encouraging us to participate.